Luigi, Margaret Colony et al. versus Ralph Monroe et al. and Sherry Bockwinkel et al. Council, would you please make your appearances for the court? Good morning, Your Honor. I'm John Kester, representing the United States Current Limits Incorporated and several voters of the state. Your Honor, Stephen Smith, representing the Colony Plaintiffs. Your Honor, Lloyd Cutler, representing the Nathan's Congressman Henry Hahn. Ted Forstead, representing the Plaintiff Susan Forstead. Kevin Hamilton, Your Honor, representing the Nathan's American Civil Liberties Union. Jim Ferris and Jeff Even, Your Honor, representing the state defendants. Richard Bell, representing the Citizens of the Planned Limit. Holly Price, representing the Limit. Peter Mitchell, representing the Limit and Sherry Bockwinkel. Deborah LaPetra and John Rowan for Citizens for Term Limit. And Dick Durham, representing the Council. Good morning, everyone. And welcome to the court, especially to those who are here from afar. The briefs in this case, I want to tell you at the start, have been very helpful, very well done on all sides. And they have spoken most eloquently to a public issue of the first importance. We're here to have oral argument on the pending motions. And we've set aside three hours total, one and a half hours per side. And you've all received the order dividing up that time. Of course, it's divided equally on both sides. I've received from Plaintiff's Council a proposed allocation of time on their side of the fence, which contemplates having 15 minutes for rebuttal. So what I would propose to do is to allow that and let each side divide its time on the issues on which we allocated 80 minutes per side, which have to do with constitutionality of the initiative. It seems to me each side could have 65 minutes to speak initially and then 15 minutes for rebuttal. Does any party see any objection to that? All right, we'll proceed accordingly. I want to explain to you also that this district is one of a few in the United States where we are letting cameras in the courtroom on an experimental basis in federal civil cases. Our experience with it, by and large, has been very good. The cameras are not obtrusive, and it greatly enhances public access to the courts. But if any council has any comment on that procedure after this is all over, I'd be glad to hear from you by letter. Now, we'll have a 15-minute recess in the middle of the morning, so we should be all finished with everything for today's purposes by somewhere around 12.15 to 12.30. Does anybody have anything to take up before we start the arguments? If not, let's begin with the arguments on standing and ripeness, which we've allocated as 10 minutes per side, a total of 20 minutes. Mr. Kester? Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, and may it please the Court. For the record, again, I'm John Kester from Williams and Connolly in Washington, D.C., representing several individual citizens of the state of Washington and U.S. Term Limits, Incorporated, which is the national grassroots organization supporting term limits laws and other restrictions on long-term incumbents. And this morning, Your Honor, in opening these proceedings, I feel a little bit like the Grinch who stole Christmas, because I have to begin by pointing out, and so will Mr. Ferris after me, counsel for the state of Washington, that today, January 11th, 1994, these cases don't belong in this court at all. This court, under clear and repeated and recent holdings of the Supreme Court of the United States and the Ninth Circuit, lacks jurisdiction to hear them. Now, we're taking only a few minutes this morning of this argument time to explain why. 
But I would like to emphasize that the relatively small time allocation uh, does not represent the importance of these issues. It represents negotiations among the parties and also, Your Honor, the fact that what needs to be said about the jurisdictional issue in this case really doesn't take long to say. The plaintiffs in these cases, who are the Speaker of the House, Thomas Foley, and others, are asking this court to invalidate and enjoin a law, an initiative passed by the voters of the state of Washington in 1992, that someday may restrict printed ballot access, but not candidacy, for long-term incumbents in the House of Representatives and the Senate. But that law, Your Honor, does not affect anyone today. And it will not affect anyone running for office next November in the elections of 1994. <clears throat> and it will not affect anyone running for office two years later in November 1996. In fact, it cannot affect the ballot access of anyone, including Speaker Foley, until at the very earliest the election of November 1998, and then only if a whole series of assumptions that the plaintiffs put forward come about. Assumptions about what will happen in the political world, about the outcomes of future elections that haven't been held yet, <coughs> about the actions of legislatures in the next five years, about the actions of the U.S. Congress in the next nearly five years. Mr. Foley and his co-plaintiffs have brought a complaint that not only is not ripe, as we lawyers say, it may never happen. It is. How, how could it happen? How do you think this question could become ripe as you see it for decision by a federal court? I think it, it could be ripe, Your Honor, and, and I'm putting aside now the issue of standing, which is something else. And I'll focus my answer on Speaker Foley. It could become ripe, I would say, and I believe the state agrees with me, if Mr. Foley wins the election of 1994, and if Mr. Foley wins re-election in 1996, then, and if we get close to the election of 1998, and I would say 1997 is probably close enough, I would think at that point, assuming Mr. Foley is in good health and interested and wants to run in the election of 1998, he could come into this court and ask for a decision of this issue. Wouldn't that mean, if you timed it that way, wouldn't that mean you could not possibly get a final decision from an appellate court till after the election? Not at all, Your Honor. Not at all. Your Honor, I was in a case in 1972 that went from a complaint in the district court in the District of Columbia through the District of Columbia circuit with full opinions written to the Supreme Court of the United States with, this, with an opinion written by the Supreme Court of the United States in six days. It is possible to expedite cases when it's necessary to do so. And the, the appellate courts certainly know how to do that. That case was called O'Brien versus Brown. It's in 409 U.S. So you would think early 98 would be the soonest? Uh... I'll give him 1997, Your Honor. I won't give him 1994. Do you think uh, waiting that long would have uh, an adverse effect, uh, not just on a candidate for Congress, but on the voters generally? I don't think it would have an adverse effect at all. But what it would do, Your Honor, is it would put a concrete case before the court. Right now, we don't even know what that state law exactly means. As, as Your Honor has seen from the briefs that have been filed here, what we've done is we've smoked out a disagreement between the plaintiffs and the officials of the state of Washington as to what Washington's own initiative law means. Plaintiffs say, in these circumstances, a long-term incumbent couldn't file a declaration of candidacy. State says, we don't read the, the law that way at all. The plaintiffs came in and they say, well, for a write-in vote, the voter would have to put this on the ballot and this information on the ballot, and it would be very complicated. And the state officials come back and they say, we don't read our state law that way at all. In this sort of a situation, 
it certainly is appropriate to give the state of Washington at least a chance to clarify and explain what its old law means, and only the state courts can authoritatively do that. At this point, the state officials haven't even done it. The Secretary of State hasn't done it, and the Attorney General. And the reason they haven't done it, Your Honor, there's no reason for them to do it. There's no case or controversy here right now. The Foley plaintiffs asked this court to make every one of the following string of political assumptions, and these aren't all of them. They say, Mr. Foley says he certainly, no doubt about it, will be reelected in 1994. He says he certainly will be reelected in 1996. He says he will not for any reason fail to run in 1998. He says the state of Washington won't change its law over the next five years. He says the US Congress, which has hearings scheduled for this spring, is not going to take any action nationally on term limits for the next five years. And although he says he's an absolute shoe in to win re-election in 1994 and 1996, he says if, if the law is in effect against him in 1998, he has virtually no chance of winning at all. And he uses words like impending and looming to try to come up with some kind of harm in 1994. Well, five years, Your Honor, is an awfully long loom. The first election that this law can affect is four years and 10 months from today. Now, just think back a moment, if you will, Your Honor. What was the world like four, months, four years and 10 months ago? Better for the most part. <laughs> Your Honor, Your Honor, I would I would have to I would have to disagree with that in in, in several respects. If you go, if you look back four years and ten months, the Berlin Wall was standing. There was a country called the Soviet Union, ruled by one Mikhail Gorbachev. Mr. Foley was not the Speaker of the House. After his landslide victory, we had just inaugurated a very popular new president, George Bush, who promised not to raise our taxes. No state had any kind of term limits law. And the Congress had not held any hearings on term limits, like the hearings it held just two months ago and the ones it has scheduled for the spring. I submit, Your Honor, that when the plaintiffs filed their complaint, they should have filed for the court along with it a crystal ball because only a crystal ball could test all the <coughs> prognostications and guesses and predictions that the complaint depends on. Now, newspaper pundits, of course, they all do have crystal balls, which they consult all the time. And I would point out respectfully to the court that the pundits don't agree with Mr. Po Mr. Foley. Uh, they say as recently as two days ago, Mr. David Broder, who doesn't like term limits, wrote in his column that he expects the law to change. And he says, this Congress or next, the issue seems almost certain to come to a vote. That's in, a, in the Washington Post of January 9, 1994. The court should not be asked to get into such guesswork, and the Supreme Court has said that it should not. Let me take just a moment to talk about the case law. All right, you have about uh, two minutes left. Okay. Uh, Your Honor, we cited in a, a motion filed even before the first round of briefing, there have been three rounds of briefing in this case, we cited recent important Supreme Court decisions on ripeness and standing. Whitmore in Arkansas, Rennie against Gary, decided in 1990 and 1991. We, decide, we cited many Ninth Circuit cases, such as the Pacific Legal Foundation case in which the Ninth Circuit says, Plaintiffs may not establish a justiciable controversy by simply asserting that the risk of future harm causes them a present injury. And, Your Honor, I waited with bated breath to see what the plaintiffs would say in response to those cases. And we had the first round of briefing, and what did they say? They said nothing. And we had another round of briefing, and we cited the cases again. And they came back, and I read their briefs with expectation, and they said nothing. And we had a third round of briefing. And they still said nothing. They have never cited Rennie against Geary, perhaps the most important Supreme Court precedent on this, and the most recent. And the Supreme Court in Rennie against Geary doesn't say that the court should go ahead and hear a case just because the issues seem important. The Supreme Court in Rennie against Geary said just the opposite. It said at the end of that case, 
The free speech issues argued in briefs filed here have fundamental and far-reaching import. For that very reason, we cannot decide the case based on the amorphous and ill-defined record presented to us. And, uh, Your Honor, every lawyer in this courtroom, and there are many of them, knows very well that these cases have a glaring and gaping and obvious jurisdictional defect. Indeed, our friends from Limit, who now are arguing in favor of this court issuing an advisory opinion, a few months ago were so sure of the lack of jurisdiction that they filed a motion to dismiss. They're now arguing... Time has just about expired. Now. Okay, they're arguing against their own motion. Your Honor, it's like Ross Perot's crazy ant in the basement. The problem is there. They don't want to talk about it, but we all know it's there. The Supreme Court precedent is clear, Your Honor, and we ask that the complaints on jurisdictional grounds under Article Three of the U.S. Constitution be dismissed. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Ferris. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, may it please the Court, for the record, I'm Jim Ferris from the Attorney General's Office representing the state defendants. I didn't realize you'd plan to speak on this. The whole 10 minutes has been used up. If I can use 30 seconds, Your Honor. Yes, you I certainly have one point, uh, why we associate ourselves with the argument. Our position as representing state officials is, yes, we defend this initiative, but we also defend the right of the people and the legislature to continue to continuously reconsider uh, the law. And while uh, we share the view of some of the other people that it's nice to have the luxury to have five years to resolve this issue before the, the law really goes into effect, that's also five years that the people gave themselves to reconsider, gave the legislature time uh, to refashion the statute before it actually goes into effect. We think it's very important to preserve that uh, and uh, that all in all, those considerations outweigh the important considerations uh, which would argue in favor of deciding the case now. For that reason, we join in the motion. If a statute is unconstitutional, and I'm not talking about this one, just hypothetically, if a statute is unconstitutional and if the question is ripe otherwise, do you think the possibility that the legislature might amend the statute would be a reason to decline to decide the case? Yes, I do, because the legislature has several years in which to reconsider and, or, at the very least, uh, resolve some of the ambiguities in the statute. But that's true of every statute, isn't it? That's true, but I think the problem with, with six years in advance is it's, it's just, as Mr. Kester said, so unclear whether this statute will even be in this form before it ever directly affects anyone. All right, thank you. Now the proponents of standing and ripeness, Mr. Smith. Thank you, Your Honor. The Supreme Court, Your Honor, in Abbott Laboratories versus Gardner set forth some practical guidelines to determine justiciability in cases just like this. First, it asked lower courts to review the, fitnesses of, the fitness of the issues for judicial determination, and second, to determine the hardships to the parties in withholding consideration. This case is fit for consideration now. First, the issues to be decided by the court are purely matters of law, and this is demonstrated in part by the fact that all parties have filed cross motions for summary judgment. Second, there are no facts which any party can recite now which will make this case any more justiciable one, two, or four years from now. I'd suggest Mr. Ferris's suggestion that the legislature might repeal the statute is uh, there's no basis in fact for that at all. There's no indication at all that that will occur. Hardship to the parties will escalate with delay in consideration. We've attached as Exhibit G to the Wilgus Declaration mailings that Limit has already sent out attacking Plaintiff Foley as a long-term incumbent adversely affected by the term limits law. U U.S. term limits promised in page four of its reply brief to seek pledges from every candidate for Congress in 1994 that they will support term limits. Delay will also affect campaign strategies. I think this, uh, the Ninth Circuit in Joyner versus Mofford, as well as the Seventh Circuit in the Buckley versus Illinois board case, talked about the leisureliness of litigation and the fact that it may take time to resolve issues of uh, electoral importance and that that may well affect campaign strategies. So under the general principles of justiciability, this case is ready for consideration now. But also under the particular doctrines of ripeness and standing, it is ready for determination. Suppose this measure 
didn't bar anybody from the ballot until the election of 2008 or 2012. Would you still say it's ripe now? Well, I think the case of Buckley versus Illinois Board is instructive. Uh, perhaps that's too far in the future. But in Buckley versus Illinois Board, the court found standing and ripeness in a case in which a candidate had declared an intention to run for office in 2002. In Signorelli versus Evans, a Second Circuit case in 1980, the court also found standing for two judges, neither one of whom uh, had actually started a campaign, but both of them had declared an intention to campaign. I believe it was two and four years into the future. I think the message of those cases is that if the court is convinced that harm will occur and there's no reason for delay, why burden the judiciary and run the risk of impinging on campaigns? Thomas versus Union Carbide is a 1985 United States Supreme Court case involving much the same type of consideration. That case involved a challenge to the mandatory arbitration provisions of the Federal Pesticides Act. And even though none of the plaintiffs had, had been affected by that act at the time the case was filed, the court said that there were purely legal issues that wouldn't be clarified by further factual development and that the plaintiffs inevitably will be harmed. Under the standing rules in this circuit, I direct your honor's attention to the Idaho Conservation League versus MUMA case. I know you're familiar with that case that adopted a three-part standing test. I don't believe the second or third legs of that test are even at issue in this case. What's been contended is that there's no personal injury by the plaintiffs. I think I've indicated how at least Congressman Foley has already been injured to date. But the lesson of that case is Alre that Already to date in, in what respect? In that he's already been attacked as a long-term incumbent who will be subject to the law. But that case is instructive because it says that you do not need to have even present injury if the court is satisfied that injury will occur if no action is taken and the injury is either threatened or contingent injury. I think one point the other side makes is that it's impossible to tell at this stage who will be injured. Do we have to be able to identify a person with precision as a potential candidate? I think it's certain that someone will be injured. And I think the lesson of the Idaho uh, Conservation League case versus MUMA is the court needs to look to determine whether or not injury will occur. Uh, the requirement of rightness was met in the two uh, candidacy cases that I've indicated by a declaration of intent to run. The courts there were concerned that if you waited too long until after harm has occurred, uh, it will be too late. The purpose of a declaratory judgment act like this is, or an action like this, is to prevent the harm from actually occurring. There are four categories of plaintiffs in this case. I think it's clear under Ninth Circuit holding that both the candidate and voters have standing to challenge an election law, and I direct your honor to the Irum versus Cayetano case. 881 Federal 2nd 689. A candidate had standing in Joyner versus Mofford, and again, a voter had, had standing as well as a candidate, uh, excuse me, a voter had standing under Burdick versus Takushi. Uh, I'd suggest, Your Honor, that uh, under the rule of the Guam Society case, the Ninth Circuit case in 1992, all this court need find is standing as to one plaintiff. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Mr. Bell? It may it please the court, uh, I think the question is one of rightness. There are several plaintiffs, one uh, two are voters, uh, one is a developer who's trying to develop a science center in uh, Spokane, and uh, he would be harmed, he says, because uh, he, he would lose his sponsor, Speaker Foley. The voters need, I suppose, have, should have a right to the stability in the government. They'd like to know. Uh, what the law's going to be, they might want to run for office. And then Speaker Foley is certainly uh, in a predicament uh, in so far as rightness is concerned. He's the Speaker, and if he's going to be out in a short time, it might make some difference as to who's going to succeed him. Uh, it could have an effect on committee uh, chairs. And uh, gen generally, it gets to me, it gets down to be a question of stability in the government. Now, this law has been a, in effect, uh, was passed over a year ago. We're just getting around to the first arguments. And to wait and depend, as Mr. Kester suggests, that we go on a six-day uh, hearing from District Court, Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court, 
certainly would not uh, give the court time for mature consideration of the of the issues. Uh, 2008 would be too long, I would think. But uh, this is far shorter time than that. So I would uh, say that the, uh, the matter is right, and I would ask the question: if if not now, when will these great questions be answered? Well, it's been, it's, been, it's been suggested that 1997 or 1998 would be the right time to well, sue. We have five, uh, that would give us uh, three years or uh, four years of instability. Nobody knows how long, whether they could run for re-election at that time. Seems to me everyone needs, deserves an answer so they can make plans. They, uh, finding candidates, uh, getting, uh, it's important. Uh, voters no, need to know um, what the future is, what the future holds, and uh, I can't imagine a situation where you couldn't get a ruling in advance on how the Congress was going to be constituted. And this is uh, uh, something that's not only in the state of Washington, it's in more than 20 states. And the, the uh, people of the country deserve a ruling and now, and uh, finally a ruling in the Supreme Court, because it's not a eventually one of these cases will get to the Supreme Court. So I would uh, say it, it's right now. And uh, the uh, one thing that has to be decided is what if, if the court should rule that it's a political question, there would be time needed for the Congress to consider uh, the validity of this uh, state law. That's another reason for it to be uh, decided now. The court might very well hold that this will is a political question left to the Congress. Speaker Foley has a remedy in the Congress, so that would take some time. I believe we, we don't have too much time. I think uh, by the time this law goes into effect, uh, we may not still have enough time to get some of these things decided. But we need to get started now, I think, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. Now, the question of constitutionality. We'll hear first from the uh, Plaintiffs urging that the initiative is unconstitutional. And according to your roster, uh, Mr. Smith is to speak first. That's correct, Your Honor. Your Honor, this is a case of unusual constitutional importance. And it's not because it involves term limits, but because a state has attempted to impose a qualification on members of Congress by using a guise or a gimmick of the type that was specifically criticized by the United States Supreme Court in Powell versus McCormick. I intend to discuss three main issues this morning. Please let me summarize them. First, on qualifications, <coughs> Initiative 573, the term limits law, imposes a qualification on members of Congress in violation of Article I, Sections 2 and 3 of the U.S. Constitution. Under Powell versus McCormick, this is forbidden. As a qualification, the term limits law cannot be a legitimate times, places, or manner restriction on elections. Further, both the intent and the purpose of the term limits law are at odds with any legitimate time, places, and manner re regulations. Also, the states have no authority to impose additional qualifications on members of Congress including the purported authority under the Ninth and Tenth Amendments. Second, if the term limits law were somehow constitutional under the qualifications analysis, it still violates the plaintiff's First and Fourteenth Amendment rights, particularly the rights of political association, and we're relying primarily on the Supreme Court cases of Chastian versus Republican Party and U versus San Francisco County Democratic Central Committee. Last, the term limits law deprives plaintiffs of their rights under the Constitution in violation of 42 U.S.C. Section 1983. Turning first to the qualifications analysis, the Constitution in Article I, Sections 2 and 3 sets forth three qualifications for members elected to Congress, age, citizenship, and residency. In Powell versus McCormick, the U.S. Supreme Court reviewed the scope of the Qualifications Clause in connection with an attempt by the House of Representatives to refuse to seat Adam Clayton Powell for the 90th Congress. 
Mr. Powell and several voters challenged the House action under Article I, Section 2 by filing a complaint which alleged specifically that the qualifications set forth in the article were exclusive. The Powell Court underwent an extensive historical review to determine if that qualification was true. And it's important, Your Honor, because that's exactly the same kind of review that you would be doing had the Powell Court not already done so. First, it looked at the convention debates. The records of the debates convinced the court that the framers' intent was to make the qualifications unvariable by Congress. The court quoted James Madison during the debate on qualifications with an admonition that Madison's statements says much about the framers' views on qualifications. And Madison said that qualifications of the elected ought to be fixed in the Constitution. The court also found that Madison's view was supported by the writings of commentators, the plain language of the Qualifications Clause itself, and by post-convention debates and writings. Then the court turned specifically to post-ratification actions by the states in the first 100 years after ratification. This was considered by the Powell Court to be important because it was closest in time to the adoption of the Constitution. The court considered the McCreary case, which involved the question of the exclusion of a Maryland resident or representative for failure to meet the additional residency requirement imposed by the state of Maryland. And note that it was an additional qualification imposed by a state and not the federal government or Congress. In resolving the issue of exclusivity of qualifications, the court quoted a report by the House Committee on Elections. It said, the qualifications of the members have been unalterably determined by the federal convention unless changed by an authority equal to that which framed the, the Constitution at first. Neither the states or the federal legislatures are authorized to add to those qualifications. Powell effectively decided that the states have no authority to add qualifications as a necessary corollary to its decision because it ruled that the qualifications were exclusive and unalterable. Powell also stated in the context of its discussion of the McCreary case at page 543 that Congress in McCreary was focusing in on the more narrow issue of the power of states to add qualifications. So if the Powell court decided the much broader issue, whether the qualifications clause was exclusive and unalterable by anyone, the more narrow issue of the power of the states or of Congress to alter was resolved by the adoption of that general principle. Also, federal, several federal courts after Powell have read that decision to preclude the right of anyone, including states, to impose additional qualifications. For example, the Ninth Circuit decision in Joyner versus Mofford stated that stated the premise of exclusive qualifications, both as to states and Congress, citing Powell. There are also six federal court decisions cited in page 23 of our opening brief, all holding or stating that the qualifications clause barred states from imposing additional qualifications. Do you think a state can constitutionally require a candidate for the House of Representatives to be a resident of the district in which he or she runs? I think that that would be an additional qualification, and I think that is the lesson of the McCreary case. So that would be unconstitutional? A resident of the state or a resident of the district? The district. I think that that would be an additional qualification, yes, Your Honor. And I think that there are several cases cited in our brief that, that, that hold for that proposition. Can a state require that a person prove party affiliation in order to get on the ballot? I believe that that would be an indirect burden on a candidate and that that would not, uh, that may be a legitimate times, places, and manner restriction uh, to uphold party unity and prevent party factionalism. There you might tip over into the time, places, and manner evaluation. It's an indirect burden on the candidate and there is no intent to bar the candidate from office. I think that's the lesson <coughs> of Joyner versus Mofford. If a state requires party affiliation or lack of it to get on the ballot, isn't that the same as defining a class of persons who can't get on the ballot? Oh, I, I misunderstood your question. It, to be a member of any 
it had to be a member of any party? Well, the party, let's suppose, maybe it's better if we take the Storer case. A state requires that if you're going to run as an independent, you not recently have run as a, <coughs> as a, a party nominee or be registered as such. Is there any difference between that and this in the sense that you're then de deciding a, or defining rather a class of persons who can't be elected? Well, I think there's a big difference in the cases and I think that both the Storer case and Joiner make it clear that if the purpose of the statute is to impose an indirect burden on the candidates and there's an intent to serve a legitimate state interest, such as uh, uh, eliminating a cluttered ballot or eliminating party factionalism, that type of regulation and burden is appropriate under the Times, Places, and Manner law. But it's not appropriate to have an intention to both directly burden a particular type of candidate and have an intention to affect the outcome of an election or to effect the outcome of an election. Can a state require that a candidate be a registered voter in that state? A candidate for Congress, that is. Again, that's, a, that's the kind of issue that you would have to balance the state's interest. If the state determines that it's a, a reasonable uh, burden, an indirect burden on the candidate, uh, it, that measure might be upheld. In this particular case, whether or not someone is a registered voter uh, largely overlaps the qualifications that are, are in existent, or are already in existence uh, under the qualifications clause. So a court may take the position that because the burden on being a registered voter is very slight in addition to the existing qualifications, that it would constitute an indirect burden, uh, particularly if there was no intent to bar someone from election. Well, aren't you then barring those who are not registered voters? That, that could possibly occur, that's right, Your Honor. But I would suggest that that would be an indirect burden on a candidate not difficult to overcome. I'd be interested in knowing what the specific state's interests are in terms of, of imposing that additional requirement. But I think under the analysis of Joyner versus Mofford, that would be uh, a slight additional burden and that that would not have an intent to remove someone from uh, candidacy because they could do something very small in order to qualify. I think that's contrasted very sharply with this type of case where the burdens imposed are great, the burdens have an intention to deprive someone from office, and the burdens are very difficult and severe, very hard to overcome. We're unaware of a single case cited by the defendants which holds to the contrary on the issue of whether or not states can impose additional qualifications. In their attempt to find any case in which a state opposed imposed qualification was upheld, several of the defendants have quoted from a passage in Storer versus Brown, which talked about state election codes regulating the selection and qualification of candidates. That discussion had nothing to do with the qualifications of candidates, but rather procedures under state election codes to qualify for the ballot, such as a minimum level of support. Term limits is clearly a qualification. We know this from the history of the convention, from recent cases attempting to impose term limits on federal candidates, and from the intent of the measure itself. Term limits predated the Constitutional Convention. Delegates to the Confederation Congress had limited terms under the Articles of Confederation. A plan to impose term limits on measures of Congress was introduced at the Constitutional Convention as a part of the Virginia Plan and it was rejected along with other attempts to impose qualifications uh, such as property and wealth. The only two cases that have addressed the issue have decided that a term limit on congressional officials is a qualification, and that is the Stump versus Lau case in Nevada and the Hill versus Tucker case in Arkansas. Last and most important is that the term limits law falls within the scope of a qualification under the test that's been adopted in the Ninth Circuit in Joyner versus Mofford, and I'm referring the court to page 1528. First, it imposes a direct burden on the candidate. And second, it has an intent to impose a qualification. The intent of the statute 
is an important criterion in its evaluation as either a qualification or a time, place, and manner restriction. And this is true not only in Joyner versus Mofford, but also in the US Supreme Court case of Storer versus Brown at page 730. Here, the facts and circumstances uh, surrounding the passage of the measure indicates the intent to impose a qualification. And Your Honor, I've provided you with some uh, copies of the exhibits that we uh, are prepared to use this morning. First of all, the voter's pamphlet makes it very clear what the intent of this statute is. In the state of Washington, under the High Star case, which is found at 106 Washington 2nd, 455, the voter's pamphlet is a relevant document in terms of deciding the intent of an initiative measure. Now, the proponents of the term limits law argue that this is just a ballot access measure and is not a term limits provision at all. Your Honor, I suggest that the fingerprints of term limits are all over the voter's pamphlet. Fourteen places in the voter's pamphlet statement in favor of the measure is the phrase term limits or limitation of terms. There's clearly an intent to impose term limits as a part of this measure. Turning to the statute itself, Your Honor, the intent of the measure is found in the preamble. Notice that it's codified as a term limits measure by the state of Washington. Its purposes are stated in section one, rotation in office, and removing all of the purported deficiencies of entrenched incumbency. Clearly, the intent is to remove entrenched incumbents from office, not to enact a ballot access measure. Would it be constitutional without this accompanying text, do you think? No. What difference does the text really make, then? I think that the text shows the importance of, or it shows clearly what the intent of the measure is and under the Joyner versus Mofford standard, that's one of the two things that courts look to when deciding how a measure fits on the continuum. At one end, you have qualifications, and at the other end, you have time, places, and manner restrictions. And in order to determine the difference between the two, courts are asked to look at whether or not there's a direct or indirect <coughs> burden on the candidate, and what is the intent of the measure. Could that get us into a question of fact for trial as to what the intent is? I don't believe so, particularly where we're looking at the documents that support the measure, documents that constitute the preamble, and the statute itself. Well, the argument on the other side would be we're not trying to limit terms, we're just leveling the playing field. Well, I understand that that's their argument, but uh, I'd submit that clearly the intent here is to eliminate long-term incumbents. And it's even more glaringly shown in the text of the statute itself. I have up on the, th the thing I'm trying to get at here is do you think it's necessary to make a fact finding on the <clears throat> intent of a measure like this? I think Your Honor can indicate that as a rationale for the decision where the intent is contained within the statute and the voter's pamphlet itself. I do not think it's necessary to have a trial on that issue. I think all In other words, you think you're entitled to summary judgment on what the intent is? I think we're entitled to summary judgment on the issue of what is a qualification. And in support of that view, the court can find that the evidence clearly shows that the intent was, as based upon the statute itself, to impose a qualification. And if there were no evidence of the intent, you'd reach the same result? If there were no, no evidence of intent whatsoever, it would be much more difficult because then the court could only look at what was the burden on the candidate, whether it was direct or indirect under the joint standard. How about the burden on the voters? Well, I think that definitely should be considered but more in the context of the First and Fourteenth Amendment arguments, which I'll get to in just a moment. I think that the statute itself provides the most glaring indication of what is the intent of the measure. In Section 7, it talks about what happens when a candidate does not uh, qualify because of the uh, triggering of the term limits measure. And it says that the Secretary of State or other election official 
cannot accept a declaration of candidacy from a person who is affected by reasons of Section 2 through 5 and is ineligible for office. There's no indication that the candidate is ineligible for the ballot, but ineligible for office itself. I think the identities of the parties are also an indication of what is the intent of this measure. U.S. term limits, citizens for term limits, limit. Limit submitted 13 affidavits in this case, all extolling the virtues of term limits itself. And although I don't concede that that's an issue in the case, it's clear that that is the intent of Limit, which was the sponsor of Initiative 573. Your Honor, the time, place, and manner argument and the ballot access characterization is just a gimmick or a guise. The reason for this ruse is obvious, because the parties were concerned about the application of the Qualifications Clause and Powell. And Powell itself criticized the use of guises or gimmicks just like this to get around the Qualifications Clause. It said at page 547 that you can't use a guise to allow a qualification to be established when you're purporting to judge qualifications. So just as the court in Powell said you can't use one provision of the Constitution uh, as a guise or a ruse to get around the Qualifications Clause, nor can the sponsors of this and the defendants in this case use a fictitious time, place, and manner argument or a ballot access argument to get around the fact that this is a qualification. The traditional times, places, and manner Cases like Jennison Fortson and Storr versus Brown are at odds with this type of measure. First, their intent is to uh, create a fair and read readable ballot and to promote ballot integrity. We've submitted declarations from two eminent scholars on voting behavior that the purpose of this measure is to do just the opposite. It intends to impose a result not to create a neutral election procedure. It also makes the ballot process far more complicated rather than less complicated. And last, it's likely to promote not to diffuse party factionalism by raising questions as to whom the party nominee really is in a case where a long-term incumbent is affected. In sum, Your Honor, this case is unique to times, places, and manner jurisprudence for a couple of reasons. It has an intent to impose a result, not a procedure. And the class of candidates that's affected is not a group with lesser support, as has occurred in the cases that I've mentioned, but a situation where a group, long-term incumbents, with demonstrated support by a majority of voters are effectively removed from the electoral process. This can be done only by constitutional amendment. The Ninth and Tenth Amendments do not provide any basis for term limits laws. I think our position is adequately set forth at page 21 through 29 of our brief, and I know that Mr. Cutler will be addressing that in just a minute. But I did want to say one thing. The purpose of the Tenth Amendment is set forth in the language of the amendment itself. It provides that the states have reserved to them powers that are not allocated to the federal government uh, and to the Constitution. If Powell stands for anything, <clears throat> it's that the right to set qualifications is fixed and exclusively allocated to the Constitution. Your Honor, I'd now like to turn to arguments under the First and Fourteenth Amendment. And I'm going to emphasize primarily the associational rights of the plaintiffs. All of the parties agree that the analysis of the First and Fourteenth Amendment rights should be done under the framework of Anderson versus Celebrezzi and Burdick versus Takushi. Under the Anderson test, there are three things to look at. First, what are the plaintiff's rights? Here, the First Amendment rights of association. Second, evaluate the state's interests. Here, to limit the terms of long-term incumbents. And third, 
It asks the question, are the interests narrowly protected by this law so as to limit the burden on the plaintiff's rights? It's important to consider these issues in the context of two fairly recent US Supreme Court cases which decided uh, associational rights in favor of the plaintiffs in those cases. First, Tashjian versus Republican Party is a 1986 US Supreme Court case in which the party challenged that state's closed primary law where voters were required to be registered members of the party in whose primary they voted. The court held that time, place, and manner election restrictions cannot infringe on fundamental rights such as the right of association. There, the abridgment included a limitation on the identification of a candidate with a political party, which the court held provided information about the views of the candidate, and also deprived the party of information on how the candidate would fare with a significant group of voters. And then it quoted Celebrezzi. It said, quote, a state's claim that it is enhancing <coughs> the ability of its citizens to make wise decisions by restricting the flow of information to them must be viewed with skepticism. Here, the voters are restricted by the exclusion of all information on a long-term incumbent in all official publications, including the party affiliation of the incumbent and the status of the incumbent as that party's standard bearer. The second case, U versus San Francisco County Democratic Central Committee is a US Supreme Court case in 1989. That case involved a California election code provision which banned a party's endorsement of candidates in primary elections. Again, the court found the code unconstitutional under First Amendment rights of association in the same kind of analysis that was employed in Tastian because it determined that the measure itself re restricted the flow of information about the candidate and the party to the voters. It hampered the party's ability to spread its message. It limited the voters' abilities to inform themselves. And most important, it said it infringed on the party's and the voters' rights to identify those people who are the party standard bearers. The rights of the plaintiffs to associate here are directly impaired by the term limits law and are unconstitutionally burdened under the rules in you and Tastian. Let's look first at the candidate. The candidate under the term limits law cannot appear in the voter's pamphlet. He cannot appear on any ballot. He cannot appear in official campaign notices as the party's representative. This is the same type of restriction on the flow of information regarding party affiliation that the court criticized in Tastian. The candidate is also impaired from running as the party standard bearer, which was criticized in the U case. The, the candidate cannot appear on the general election ballot, which is where many voters look to determine who the party nominee is of that particular party. Party adherents, such as plaintiff chief, are also similarly impaired. His support of a long-term incumbent may be at the expense of another party nominee since the incumbent cannot appear on the ballot and it's likely that some other party nominee will. And the candidate of his choice is impaired in running as that party's official candidate. Let's turn to the state's interest. Under the Anderson analysis, we weigh the state's interest in limiting terms, but here it's a broad limitation which encompasses federal and state officials. I don't believe that the state has a legitimate interest at all in proposing or in enforcing the type of measure which attempts to effect the outcome of an election. I also don't believe under the qualifications clause that the state has any interest in dictating the terms of office or regulating the terms of office uh, of federal officials. Under this analysis, the term limits law violates both the First and Fourteenth Amendment rights of association of the plaintiffs. Very briefly, Your Honor, on Section 1983, the plaintiffs have properly alleged a deprivation of Section 
1983, or excuse me, uh, alleged a 1983 violation, uh, a deprivation of rights under the Constitution, including the Qualifications Clause and the First and Fourteenth Amendments. The primary defense... Do you, do you agree that the state officials who have been sued have not actually done anything yet to implement this statute? No, I think that they've done very similar to what the uh, defendants did in May versus Cooperman, which is the New Jersey case that we cited in our brief. The court found that the requisite state action was present in May versus Cooperman with the passage of the statute and limited dissemination of information within the state to other officials relating, relating to the statute. That is the type of action that has been held to be sufficient state action. Otherwise, you could not have declaratory and prospective injunctive relief like we have in this case. Why couldn't you have it apart from Section 1983, which of course is the statute that carries other remedies, attorney fees Correct. and costs and so on. Why couldn't you just have an injunction on constitutional grounds if you're entitled to it? Well, you certainly could do that, but you wouldn't have the other relief that's available under Section 1983. And the broad purpose of that statute is to encourage this type of case. Without those broad remedies, the number of these types of cases would, uh, maybe not this case, for example, but other cases which assert violation of constitutional rights may be abated because those other 1983 remedies aren't available. The state proposes no cases in support of its position that some past conduct has to be taken. Two minutes left, Mr. Thank Smith, if I'm you want to stick to 30. I'm almost finished. So we believe under the authorities that we've cited and the absence of any authorities from the state, Section 1983 relief is appropriate also. Your Honor, the Constitution is now over 200 years old. And one of the reasons it has lasted this long is that it was carefully drafted to last. The danger in this case is that the adoption of the defendant's position creates a whole new category of times, places, and manners, manner cases where a state, to avoid the strictures of the qualifications clause, can adopt restrictions on members, on its members of Congress on a state-by-state -state basis to alleviate uh, perceived deficiencies in the makeup of that state's congressional delegation. It's not hard to imagine state measures very much like this one that ban the following from the ballot. Candidates over 60 years of age, candidates who are attorneys, candidates who have a certain measure of wealth. We wouldn't want that last one. <laughs> I think you'd remove some good candidates. A decision striking down the term limits law as unconstitutional will preserve the integrity of the Qualifications Clause and the Constitution. And it doesn't leave these defendants without a remedy. If defendants seek the imposition of term limits for congressional office, they may do so in the same manner required by Powell versus McCormick, amendment to the Constitution itself. Their argument on that, of course, is that the amending process is pretty much in the hands of the Congress. What do you say to that? I don't think that's the exclusive way, but I think there's a good reason why it's difficult to amend the Constitution. And I endorse that. All right, thank you. Now, Mr. Bell, are you next? <coughs> or Mr. Cutler, rather. Mr. Cutler is next. Your Honor, I appear for Congressman Henry High, Republican of Illinois, now serving his 10th consecutive term. I'm going to deal primarily with the defendant's argument that Initiative 573 does not add a qualification, but is a constitutional ballot access restriction under the Times, Places, and Manner Clause of the Federal Constitution and under the 9th and 10th Amendment. But first, I'd like to add a word to Mr. Smith's discussion of Powell against McCormick. I was on the losing side in that case, 
and I hope I learned my constitutional lesson then and won't have to unlearn it this time. Most of the defendants concede that a time that <clears throat> Powell against McCormick does bar Congress from enacting legislation that would add qualifications, but they also maintain that the holding does not apply to the legislative power of the states and that the states are free to add qualifications under the Times, Places, and Manners Clause and the Ninth and Tenth Amendments. But the Powell Court explicitly ruled that the qualifications set out in the Constitution are exclusive. And that's why they cannot be added to by the Congress. That was the rationale. And since they're exclusive, this necessarily implies that they cannot be added to even by the states. Powell's extended discussion of the Congressman McCreary case, which Mr. Smith related to you, only makes sense on the basis that Chief Justice Warren and the Supreme Court accepted the Congressional Committee report's reasoning that the constitutional qualifications, being exclusive, prevent either Congress or the states from adding other qualifications. And the court's opinion also quotes from Madison's explanation in The Federalist that while the qualifications of the electors, the voters, were left to the states, the qualifications of the elected, the president and the members of Congress, being susceptible of uniformity, have been very properly considered and regulated by the convention. And uniformity, of course, would just be impossible if each state could add differing qualifications of its own. And as we said, the courts in 21 states, the highest state courts, a number of the federal courts, have held that they cannot, the states cannot add qualifications, property qualifications, residents in the district qualifications, convicted felon disqualifications, uh, running for a federal office, before the end of your term as a state officer, and now term limits. And there are no cases, not even a dissenting opinion, the other way. Well, there are cases that hold a state can prohibit a person from running for federal office while holding a state office. Yes, because uh, these are really times, these, uh, that is a particular interest of the state that it doesn't wish someone to hold both a federal office and a state office at the same time. But isn't but that a substantive requirement or, or limitation rather than just a matter a of procedure? It is a simple requirement which any candidate for federal office can readily meet, and it is not an undue burden. But those same cases have said, including Joyner against Moffat in this very circuit, that if the restriction is that even if you resign, you still cannot run for federal office during the balance of your state office term. That is an unreasonable restriction and is indeed an added qualification. And those are the express words of Joyner against Moffat. But if a state can constitutionally bar the governor, let's say, from running for the U.S. Senate. While he is while sitting as governor. governor. Yes, they can do that. And accepting that is but, true. Uh, what's the difference? between that on the one hand and on the other saying an incumbent in the very office can't run. Because that is a federal matter. Whether federal elected officers as a matter of policy should be barred from serving additional terms or severely handicapped in the next election by not being allowed to appear on the ballot is a matter of federal policy, not state policy. And that's essentially the holding of Powell against McCormick. Now, the <clears throat> defendants fall back, then, on the text of Article I, Clause 4, the Times, Places, and Manners Clause. But that clause itself just makes facially untenable any argument that it empowers the states to add qualifications. Clause 4, when you look at it, empowers both the states and the Congress to make times, places, and manner restrictions, regulations. Congress may make <clears throat> times, places, and manner regulations, and we, or amend the state regulations. And we know, as a result of Powell, that Congress cannot use 
the Times, Places, and Manners Clause to set additional qualifications. If Congress cannot do it, it necessarily follows that the states cannot do it either. And Hamilton, in The Federalist, quoted in our brief and quoted in Powell at page 539, says just that, that Congress cannot use its powers under the Times, Places, and Manners Clause to add qualifications that are not specified in the Constitution. The defendants next fall back on the Ninth and Tenth Amendments. The Ninth, we say, is plainly inapplicable <coughs> since it deals with the individual rights of the people, not powers of the states to legislate. The Tenth is equally inapplicable since it deals with the allocation of legislative, executive, and judicial powers between the United States and its member states. It reserves to the states only the powers that they already had before the Constitution was adopted and that the Constitution did not take away. It doesn't purport to confer new powers that the states never had before the Constitution existed, such as the power to set qualifications for the elective offices that were set up for the first time under the federal Constitution. These qualifications are established by the Constitution itself, and additions to those qualifications are not within the legislative powers of either Congress or of the states. How about the requirement that a candidate be a registered voter? Can a state do that? Uh, a state, under certain circumstances, I think might very well do that, because a candidate for office, of being a citizen, being of the proper age, and being a resident of the state has all the qualifications necessary to be a registered voter, and it is a minor burden on him, one, one he can readily meet, to be a registered voter. It seems to me that's an entirely different case. Does this mean this that, a, that a state can add minor substantive qualifications but not major ones? It can add rules of time, places, times, places, and manner rules. These would all be manner, not times and places that reasonably serve a state interest in having an uncluttered ballot and preserving party uni unity rather than factionalism, and that do not impose an undue burden on the candidate. And you see that lesson specifically in Stora v. Brown, where the court not only upheld a provision that people who had <coughs> registered of, uh, with a party affiliation or had voted in the immediately preceding primary could not appear on the ballot. <coughs> but at the very same time, the court <coughs> sent back to the lower court, because it might be unconstitutional, a requirement that independents had to have petitions signed by at least 5% of the voters in the last election. They had to do it within 24 days after the primary, and they could not count voters who had voted in the primary. A very, very difficult task to accomplish. The court said that might impose an undue unconstitutional burden on independent candidates and sent the matter back to the district court for a determination of that fact. If a state requires a candidate to be a registered voter, you would say that's a light burden, I assume? Yes. Would you also agree that's a substantive qualification? I don't consider, I, I consider that a times, places, and manner restriction. That how, a court how can it be oppose. since it, it doesn't look to the way the election is run, but rather to who can get elected? Well, it is not discriminating against anybody, Judge Dwyer. The, the basis of all of these times, places, and manner cases, the ballot access cases, is they cannot discriminate. Stora exp explicitly says when it upholds, upholds the party registration and primary voting aspects that they do not discriminate. Uh, uh, the Takushi case says the same thing over and over again. The court says in passing on these ballot access and similar restrictions. It's a question of whether you were discriminating against a class. It's crystal clear from the words of this statute 
that it is clearly discriminating against the class, the indictment contained in the preamble, the need, the, the fact that the people have a compelling interest in preventing the self-serving monopoly of this, this, this dynastic ruling class tells you exactly what they're about. And then in section seven, the <coughs> sheep's clothing falls right off the wolf because there is an explicit reference to eligibility for the office. You cannot put a candidate for Congress or for the Senate on the ballot or accept his declaration of candidacy if under sections four and five, which are the ones dealing with Congress, <coughs> he is ineligible for the office. And that really tells you, that's Sally Rand dropping it's her last fan. <laughs> Your mention of Sally Rand reminds us that you and I are of a different generation. And <laughs> there are many people in this room who don't know I who she was. I that, but there's always, or she's, she's preserved forever on television tape. <laughs> Some of us didn't even know that. <laughs> These ballot access cases are just crystal clear that a state cannot constantly use its control over the access to the ballot to stack the deck against a disfavored class that meets the constitutional qualifications for elected for election. Their only time they're upheld is when, they're, when their purpose is plainly to make the electoral process more orderly and fair, not when they tilt the playing field against a disfavored class such as poor people, that's Lubin against Panish, the high filing fee, such as candidates of minor parties, that's Janessa against Fortson, such as independents, or even against convicted felons. And if you can't con tilt the playing field against convicted felons, certainly you can't tilt it against those politicians who have committed what I think even Judge Bell would agree is the lesser offense of having won three consecutive elections. <laughs> Even if Initiative 573 had a valid ballot access purpose, like assuring fair and orderly party, party primaries and keeping the ballot from being cluttered from those who cannot show a reasonable level of support, it can't set rules that stack the deck. Now, Judge Bell, in his brief, I think, has said all we're trying to do is level the playing field. I believe you referred to that earlier, Judge Dwyer. But an election is not a handicapped horse race in which the state has a legitimate interest in depriving or offsetting the natural strengths of some candidates, like the speed and endurance of some horses, by putting some extra lead weight into the saddles of the other candidates so that you can produce a theoretical dead heat. That is simply not allowed under the ballot access cases. And one can visualize, as Mr. Smith pointed out to you, similar provisions that lawyers can't appear on the ballot, housewives with small children can't appear on the ballot because they ought to be staying home taking care of their kids. There are all sorts of restrictions <coughs> that you can imagine. Many of them have been tried, and all of them to date <coughs> have been struck down. How about the provision that an unregistered voter cannot appear on the ballot? Uh, this is the ballot for federal office, of yes. course. Well, I, I, I don't want to decide that case one way or the other, but I see a much greater justification for the state in that case and a much smaller burden on the individual and no indication at all of trying to disfavor a class. Which it gets is us kind back of restriction to the question that can very easily be met. Which gets us back to the question we had a few minutes ago. Do you think minor and easy to comply with additional qualifications are constitutional and just burdensome ones aren't? Well, we, we keep dancing around this word qualifications. I interpret, I think, and I think the courts use the words qual, word qualifications as a standard you must meet and that you, you are 
<clears throat> you cannot comply with readily. That's essentially it. You can't change your age. I mean, one could argue, I suppose, that if you're not a citizen, you could become a citizen. But it's reasonable, and the Constitution provides it anyway, so we don't have to worry about whether it is reasonable or not. But a state cannot pick out a class and say, for that class, we're going to level the playing field or whatever you want just because we don't think they should be in Congress. The state isn't in the business of picking winners or deciding which party should triumph any regulation that discriminates against minor parties, independents, poor people, incumbents, whatever, if it is discriminatory and imposes an unreasonable burden, is unconstitutional. Let me just, to test this, let's just suppose, since there is no state policy interest in the qualifications for federal elective office, let's suppose that this initiative had been passed not just for the state of Washington by the people of Washington, but by the Congress of the United States for the entire country under its times, places, and manner restrictions. No one who'd served for three terms or whatever could appear on the ballot in any state. That would plainly be unconstitutional under, uh, under Powell and all of the ballot access laws. Anderson against Celebrezzi tells us that if you have an unconstitutional burden, you cannot get away from it simply by providing a write-in opportunity. Anderson says expressly a write-in opportunity is not sufficient. Burdick says expressly it's not sufficient. I think Lubin against Panish says expressly it's not sufficient. The state has a much heavier burden because a federal statute, just like this state statute, would at least have what Madison called the great advantage of uniformity. It would be a nationwide statute. But a, a state statute that sets a separate rule for this state, suppose, for example, the state had said that first-term presidents cannot appear on the Washington state ballot when they run for the second term, even though the Constitution has been amended to limit presidents for two terms. <coughs> that would plainly be unconstitutional. Here we have a state statute saying members of Congress cannot appear on the ballot for their third or fourth or fifth term when, when the Constitution imposes no limits whatever on the number of terms. That would clearly be unconstitutional and would have to be struck down. Thank you. Thank you. Now next, uh, Mr. Thurston. Your quota by agreement of council seems to be uh, 10 minutes. Your Honor, the single point which I will cover is contained in the holding of Gregory versus Ashcroft. Justice O'Connor, speaking for the court, held that through the structure of government and the character of those who exercise governmental authority, a state defines itself as a sovereign. Of the two foundations of sovereignty, structure of government and the character of its own officials, I will discuss the latter, or more specifically, what the framers intended the character of the flood federal legislators to be. In turn, I will demonstrate how congressional incumbents, unfettered by term limits, were critical to the framers and the job of protecting our constitutional rights. To find out why such unfettered con congressional incumbents were critical to the framers, we, turn, we will turn to the framers' own political analysis uh, prior to the period of the Constitutional Convention. According to the Federalists, the single most important precipitating factor which led to the formation of our Constitution were the egregious attacks by the state legislatures during the Articles of Confederation against basic individual rights. Particularly appalling to the Federalists were the debt abrogation schemes passed in a number of the states. It was just such a scheme which, 
led to Shays' Rebellion, which was the last straw to many of the framers. Concerning the state legislatures, Jefferson, a states' rights advocate, co commented that elective despotism was not the government that we fought for. <clears throat> when, the frame, when the Federalists questioned the role of the state's own state constitutions, it concluded that those constitutions were not at fault. Even nearly perfect constitutions like Massachusetts had not served to protect individual liberties. Shays' Rebellion had, in fact, occurred in Western Massachusetts. When they looked at the type of individuals serving in the state legislatures, they found the answer. Their conclusion was, is that they were simply unfit. For the federal government, the framers were determined to find a way to put fit men into the federal legislature. Palatia Webster, a prominent Federalist, summed up the Federalist plan as follows. The grand secret of forming a good government is to put good men into administration. It is important to note that <clears throat> a significant portion of the Constitutional Convention debates and ratification debates were focused on the central issue of what type of persons would serve in the federal legislature. In the end, the framers opted for a system of qualifications which included only three, age, residency, and citizenship. Why do you think they phrase it in the negative? It says, uh, no person shall be a representative. To be honest with you, I don't know. There, was, there has been significant debate since about what uh, relationship the uh, I think it was the detail committee had with the, with the other committees, and uh, uh, quite frankly, no one really knows. There was a discussion of that, I believe, in Powell, Your Honor. I just wondered your view on it since uh, the drafters of the Constitution spoke very good English. They did, Your Honor. Why did they phrase that in the negative rather than setting out a positive series of qualifications? I think partly because they just simply assumed the historical context, and I think that's part of of uh, story has been criticized basically he he does make the judgment and the other writers basically of the time or at least the first major writers of the time simply reach that judgment uh, to some degree frankly based on the historical context that they were in and I think that that's part and parcel from the from the structure of the Constitution itself the argument that Mr. Cutler made concerning the time places and manner argument and those kind of things Plus, to, the long and the short of it is, is the, the Powell Court did reach the decision that that was really not really much of a factor in all, at all in their analysis. In the end, the framers opted for a system of qualifications which included only three, age, residency, and citizenship. In the process, they explicitly rejected <coughs> excuse me, property ownership, more restrictive age and residency requirements, freehold status, and term limits, among others. It was those additional qualifications or limitations, along with annual elections and large assemblies, which the Federalists believed had produced state legislatures, which had little respect for individual liberties. The Constitution's minimal qualifications for federal legislative office created a system of open competition for political leadership, allowing rich and poor, old and young, experienced and inexperienced, to run for Congress. The class restraints so despised in the English system were abolished. After all, George Washington, the most respected man in America, had come from very humble beginnings. Madison in Federalist Number 52 summed up the constitutional theory as follows. Under these reasonable limitations, the door of this part of the federal government is open to merit of every description, whether native or adopted, adoptive, whether young or old, and without regard to poverty or wealth, or to any particular profession or religious faith. <clears throat> With the door open to all, it would be reasonable to expect that experienced persons or congressional incumbents would continue to seek office and that the electorate would continue to elect them. Madison thought so. In Federalist Paper Number 53, he states, a few of the members, as it happens in all such assemblies, will possess superior talents, will, by frequent re-elections, become members of long standing, will be thoroughly masters of the public business, 
and perhaps not unwilling to avail themselves of those advantages. The greater the proportion of new members and the less information of the bulk of the members, the more apt will they be to fall into the snares that, that may be laid for them. This remark is no less applicable in, to the relation which will subsist between the <coughs> House of Representatives and the Senate. Beyond Madison's rejection of term limits is the positive value which he places on longstanding members. They will become thorough masters of public business and as masters will help and keep Congress from falling into the snares which inexperienced members are susceptible to. For Madison, for Madison and the other Federalists, the role of long-term incumbents played another important function. That is a check and balance on the vicissitudes of public opinion. When speaking of this point, Madison declared in the Federalist number 63, as the cool and deliberate sense of the community ought in all governments and actually will in all free governments ultimately prevail over the views of its rulers. So there are particular moments in public affairs when people stimulated by a regular passion or some other illicit advantage or misled by the artful misrepresentations of interested men may call for measures which they themselves will after, afterwards be most readily to lament and condemn. In these critical moments, how salutary will be the interference of some temperate and respectable body of citizens in order to check the misguided career and suspend the blow mediated by the people against themselves. One until, minute left, Mr. Thurston. Until reason, justice, and truth can regain the authority over the public mind. <clears throat> Madison's role for the federal legislature was not for a usurpation of the people's power. Quite the contrary, the role of the federal legislature and that of more experienced members of Congress in particular was to moderate the people's power, if only temporary, temporarily. No doubt he was thinking about the attacks perpetrated by the states against individual liberties. I do not believe that experience by itself and nothing more guarantees reasoned judgment, but inexperience is certainly a hazard to good judgment, as Madison pointed out. In the end, what really matters is for each citizen and voter to make such judgments about returning or not returning incumbents as they will. What is clear is that given the important role of congressional incumbents as the Federalists saw it, term limits is an unconstitutional impingement on the voters' right to make that decision for themselves. Thank you. This case involves a number of fundamental constitutional rights and is of particular importance to the American Civil Liberties Union. Indeed, the litigation touches on perhaps the single most fundamental civil liberty of all, the right to vote freely and to elect a federal representative of one's choice, unhampered by state efforts to influence or direct the outcome of that election. As the court held in Reynolds versus Sims, quote, the right to vote freely for the candidate of one's choice is the essence of a democratic society, and any restrictions on that right strike at the heart of representative government. The right to choose a representative Daniel Webster once said, is every man's portion of sovereign power. And Justice Black, who jealously protected civil liberties, held the right to vote in special regard. In Wasbury versus Sanders, he held, no right is more precious in a free country than that of having the choice in the election of those who make the laws under which, as good citizens, we must live. Other rights, even the most basic, are illusory if the right to vote is undermined. The signal importance of this right is perhaps best illustrated by the very identity of the amici before this court. It's not often that the American Civil Liberties Union stands together with Representative Henry Hyde to defend a constitutional principle. <laughs> but it's precisely because of the fundamental importance of the issues presented by this litigation that brings these two parties together before this court in this litigation. You mean if you both think it, it must be right, is Well, that that's right. <laughs> A variety of arguments have been marshaled in defendants' papers filed in this court to justify the term limits laws and appropriate state policy approved by a majority of the voters of this state. But as this court noted in its ruling uh, in Cunningham versus Metro, quote, the constitutional issue cannot be decided by a show of hands, close quote. As this court has already noted, the policy question of whether term limits is good or, or bad public policy is not relevant to the constitutional issue before the court, 
But what the court must confront is whether a state may constitutionally impose an additional qualification on candidates for federal office. I won't repeat the argument advanced by the colony plaintiffs, but only state here that I think it clear from the constitutional text that the qualifications stated in Article 1, Section 4 are exclusive and no state can demand more of a candidate. This reading of the text is amply supported by the Supreme Court's review of the framers' intent in Powell versus McCormick. The framers debated the wisdom of term limits and rejected the concept as Powell reviewed. Powell expressly confirms that the constitutional qualifications are exclusive and necessarily forecloses any argument that the states have power to add additional qualifications. But the defendant's primary argument here seems to be this is not a qualification at all, but merely a times, places, and manner restriction on ballot access. This argument must be squarely rejected. It is directly inconsistent with the admitted purpose of the uh, term limits law to tilt the playing field against a disfavored class of candidates. Although a state can certainly regulate the process of an election, no ballot access case is ever recognized as legitimate as state interest in controlling or affecting the outcome of a federal election. In assessing a purported times, place, or manner restriction, the Ninth Circuit's decision in Joyner versus Mofford directs this court to consider first the burden imposed upon a candidate and whether it's direct or indirect, and second, the state's purpose in advancing that regulation. The burden here is clear. The term limits law imposes a direct bar to the ballot on a disfavored class of constitutionally qualified candidates. It's difficult indeed to imagine a more direct burden on a candidacy. And the state's purpose, too, has been stated with unmistakable clarity by the defendants to impede the ability of a class of otherwise constitutionally qualified candidates to gain election to a federal office, even when they demonstrate this a support of a majority of the voters in a primary election. No ballot access case has ever approved such a purpose. Moreover, it should be noted in, in regard to the particular plaintiffs before the court that this state purpose is not shared by the voters of the 5th Congressional District, who not only re-elected re Speaker Foley in 1992, but rejected the term limits law. Defendants today insist that the 5th Congressional District voters cannot so choose. Thus, the term limits law fails both tests established by Joyner. It directly burdens a class of constitutionally qualified candidates, and the state can advance no legitimate purpose for doing so. The restriction constitutes an impermissible attempt to impose a qualification for federal office. It is not a time, place, or manner regulation. Finally, I'd like to briefly address the First and Fourteenth Amendment issues raised by this litigation. Even if this court determines that the term limits law does not constitute an impermissible qualification, but rather a times, place, and manner re regulation on ballot access, it should nonetheless reject the law as an unconstitutional invasion of the First and Fourteenth Amendment rights. As the Supreme Court noted in Tashian versus Republican Party, quote, the power to regulate the time, place, and manner of elections does not justify without more the abridgment of fundamental rights, such as the right to vote or the freedom of political association. Anderson versus Celebrezzi sets out the test for determining whether state regulations on ballot access can pass constitutional muster under the First and Fourteenth Amendments and directs the court to examine the character and magnitude of the asserted injury to the rights protected by the First and Fourteenth Amendments that the plaintiff seeks to vindicate. The court must then identify and evaluate the precise interests put forward by the state as justifications for the burden. Where those restrictions on protected rights are severe, the court in Burdick versus Tekushi uh, held, the state must demonstrate that the regulation is narrowly tailored to advance a compelling state interest. Here, it's difficult to characterize these restrictions as anything but severe. First, the law infringes a voter's rights to freely and effectively vote for the candidate of their choice. The Supreme Court in Williams versus Rhodes rejected a restrictive petition requirement on small political parties. The court noted that the right of qualified candidates to cast, or qualified voters to cast their votes effectively ranked among our most precious freedoms. The term limit law bar to the ballot for incumbents also directly impedes the voters' rights to vote effectively. It requires voters to acquaint themselves with the requirement of a write-in procedure and add additional information about the candidate to the ballot. And toward what end? This burden is imposed by the state precisely to be just that, a burden on the voters' right to cast their vote for the candidate of their choice, and a burden imposed to skew the results of the election. Second, the term limit law also severely burdens fundamental First Amendment associational rights of the various plaintiffs and the Democratic Party of Washington State. The right to associate with a political party of one's choice is an undeniable basic constitutional freedom guaranteed by both amendments. 
The term limits law directly bars the Democratic Party and the members of that party from nominating Speaker Foley as their congressional candidate in 1998. A party can only nominate a candidate who has filed a declaration of candidacy under state law. The term limit law precludes a barred incumbent from filing that declaration and therefore directly precludes a party from nominating the candidate of its choice, even if he or she wins majority of support in the primary. This abridges several First and Fourteenth Amendment rights. First, it abridges the associational rights of the members of the party. They cannot nominate the, nom the candidate of their choice, nor effectively promote or support the nomination in the election of the incumbent. Second, it abridges the incumbent's associational rights, who is denied the right to be associated on the ballot with his party, notwithstanding the support of his party. And finally, and maybe most directly, it abridges the party's rights, which cannot nominate nor place its preferred candidate on the ballot. This direct interference with the associational rights of the Democratic Party and its members is extreme and severe and requires that the state demonstrate that the restriction is narrowly tailored to advance a compelling state interest. Here the state can advance no such compelling state interest. Indeed, the state's confessed purpose in excluding otherwise constitutionally qualified candidates <coughs> from the ballot, even when the candidate has demonstrated majority support in a primary, cannot be recognized as a legitimate state interest, much less compelling. The state has no legitimate interest in attempting to tilt the playing field against a co constitutionally qualified candidate for federal office. The Supreme Court has rejected such impermissible invasions of associational rights in OO versus San Francisco County Democratic Central Committee and Tajan versus the Revol Republican Party of Connecticut. This court should do the same. No right is more important or more central to any democracy than the right to vote. The term limit law constitutes nothing less than a direct attempt by the state to burden the voter's right to choose among constitutionally qualified candidates. Term limits imposes a constitutionally infirm qualification and should be rejected on that ground. It cannot be defended as a times, places, and manner restriction in light of its direct burden on constitutionally qualified candidates and its improper purpose to tilt the playing field against qualified candidates. And finally, the term limits law directly invades voting and associational rights protected by the First and Fourteenth Amendments. Amicus ACLU respectfully suggests that the Colleen plaintiff's motion for summary judgment should be granted. All right, thank you. Thank you. We'll now be at recess for 15 minutes. Please rise. Seated, please. Now we'll hear from those who assert that Initiative 573 is constitutional, beginning with Mr. Ferris for the State of Defense. Thank you, Your Honor. I'm Jim Ferris, again, uh, from the Attorney General's Office representing the State Defendants. And those are uh, State Attorney General Christine Gregoire and Secretary of State Ralph Monroe, who's behind me on the first bench. He's present in the courtroom today. Uh, as a preliminary matter, I want to inform the court that uh, during the recess, the uh, defendant's side caucused and decided that we would use our entire 80 minutes now rather than reserving any time for Sir rebuttal. All right. We think we can safely give the plaintiffs the last word in this case. <laughs> Take a risk. My role will be to introduce the subject of the case with an overview of the constitutional issues presented. My colleague will then discuss many of them in more detail. Uh, as a preliminary matter, another preliminary matter, I should indicate that we have pending several motions to dismiss. Uh, of course, the court has already heard argument on those relating to justiciability. Uh, others have been resolved by a letter that I think the court received from Mr. Thorsted, those relating to whether or not the defendants have been sued in their personal capacities, and I won't consider them anymore. Uh, Mr. Smith both spoke briefly about the 1983 issue. I think the briefs adequately cover that. I think we've shown that this is not an appropriate case for 1983 relief. But unless the court has specific questions, I don't plan to include that in my part of the argument. To decide this case, the court will be called to consider, though not necessarily to decide, at least two funda fundamental constitutional issues. I want to begin by identifying those two and to suggest possible analytical approaches for the court. Then I will digress a little and I will talk a, a little about Washington's uh, write-in procedure, not because it logically follows at that point, but because we're the state and we're a more logical party to discuss that than any of the interveners. Finally, if there's time left, I want to discuss the policy 
issues that are presented by the court's constitutional choices. The first issue the court will want to look at is right at the heart, the foundation of the constitutional system. And that is how much sovereign discretion did the states retain under the Constitution? Where the Constitution is silent or unclear, should doubts be resolved for or against a state's exercise of legislative power? That issue is present here not at our request, but because the plaintiffs contend that the statute under examination here amounts to the setting of additional qualifications for federal office. And they further contend that states are without the power to set additional qualifications. So if the court is going to consider that argument that the plaintiffs have made, it will have to consider the extent to which the state has power uh, to legislate in the area of qualifications. I will not dwell on this issue. I think the briefs cover it pretty well, and some of the other counsel will touch on it as well. I want to make three basic points. First, basic first day constitutional law. The Constitution is a grant of power to the federal government and a restriction only to the extent it explicitly states so on the previous sovereign powers of the state. Uh, that is good constitutional law even before the Tenth Amendment, and I think it's confirmed by the text of the Tenth Amendment. Second, nothing in the text of the Qualifications Clause indicates any explicit preclusion of state legislation on the subject of qualifications. Third, states have an interest, a legitimate interest in the quality and nature of their representation in Congress. The plaintiffs have challenged this point, and they've said that, that senators and representatives in Congress are federal officers. Indeed, they are. Uh, but they are also important officers from the state's point of view. They are, in effect, the junction point between state and federal government in many ways. And I think they are legitimate subjects of state legislation, at least to the extent that the Constitution does not restrain such legislation. Fourth, and our primary argument here, which will be made by, I think, all of the defendants, is that issue need not be reached by the court, although it's very interesting and it's been fun to research it, because Initiative 573 does not purport to add qualifications to either of these federal offices. I think the court will see that when it's fully examined the issues presented. For that reason, I will go at this point to my second point. Before you leave that last point. Certainly. Suppose we were dealing here with an initiative which flatly said, after you've served X years in Congress, you're not eligible for re-election anymore. Would that be constitutional, do you think? I think even so, Your Honor, it could be upheld as a time, place, and manner restriction because I think the state can look beyond an individual election. It can look to a series of elections and say, qualified people can be restrained nonetheless by limitations on the length of their tenure. And I th uh, so while we don't have that before us and uh, the people have not chosen to enact the law in that form, I think it could be upheld I also think, uh, and we do argue as a backup argument, that the state could impose additional qualifications so long as they met, and this is obviously an important caveat, uh, other provisions of the Constitution. Because at least since the 14th Amendment, states are fully subject uh, in, in their legislation to restrictions that they not uh, invade the federally guaranteed constitutional rights of voters uh, and to some extent of candidates. So uh, those would always be present, and I think that, that has to, to, to be seen as a subtext of everything we say. But if they're reasonable, if they meet those other constitutional standards, uh, I think that could be done. However, that's not the case before the court today. My second point is how do the qualifications clause relate to the language in the Constitution concerning time, pace, place, and manner restrictions? I think it would be fair to characterize the discussion today as concentrating on that issue. The plaintiffs, I think, have suggested two possible lines of approach, uh, and we offer a third, I like to think better alternative, as to how to relate the two clauses together. Uh, the first one I want to discuss is that which is quite clearly outlined in the brief of Representative Hyde, and I think Mr. Uh, uh, Cutler uh, followed it uh, and was consistent with it today in his argument, uh, although he pulled back from it a little. As expressed in their brief, they take the position that any law which hinders any qualified candidate's ability to appear on the ballot and be available as a choice for the voters uh, implicates the qualifications clause. 
And because they take a very strict view of the, of the qualifications clause, I think it would necessarily follow that states are virtually without power to hinder any access to the ballot by anyone who meets the three constitutional qualifications under that doctrine. The obvious problem with it, in addition to the, the corner that I think Mr. Cutler got worked into uh, in conceding that there are certain minor restrictions, certain minor types of qualifications that, the, that states could add, is that if he is correct in that any law which would hinder a candidate's uh, right to, ball to ballot access is unconstitutional as an additional qualification, then a whole line of cases is wrong. At the very least, they were misanalyzed because the court should have considered them under the, the qualifications clause. And if the plaintiffs are correct in their analysis of the qualifications clause, they're wrong, from Storer versus Brown to Jenis versus Fortson, probably even Burdick versus Takushi. Uh, I don't think they seriously intended uh, that this court should ignore all those cases uh, or come up with a ruling that, in effect, uh, undercuts that whole line of analysis. The second analysis is suggested, and I think was more fully fleshed out in the argument <coughs> of Mr. Smith today, and that is that it is the intent of the statute uh, which makes a difference, uh, or phrased a slightly different way because they haven't uh, been particularly tight in their analysis. It's, the, it's whether the statute was intended to affect the outcome as opposed to merely set the rules of the game. I have three problems with that analysis. First, standards based on intent are notoriously hard to apply, particularly if they're based on subjective intent. And Mr. Smith invites the court to consider exactly that uh, by uh, pointing out various things uh, in the purpose of this statute, which we have no problem with being cited, but also the, various, the plaintiffs have cited various background information about the intent of the uh, sponsors of the initiative. One problem with that is under that theory, two states could simultaneously pass identical statutes, and one of them would be constitutional because it would be free of any taint of bad intent, while the other one where the evidence of bad intent was present would be unconstitutional. That's a crazy system, and I think the court should not adopt that kind of approach. Secondly, all election regulations affect the result of an election, of course. They make people who do not follow the rules of the game, they penalize them. Either they don't get to participate, they don't get to file, they don't get to appear on the ballot, they don't get a certificate of election if they win. Every election regulation affects the result. Even one which says you have to register to vote discriminates against the category of people who have not chosen to register to, to vote or who have not done so yet. I think the problem with that argument is it proves too much. It does not give the court any basis for deciding uh, in reality what are qualifications or what are not. Third, if the intent or the outcome of the statute is the standard, I think an excellent argument could be made that Initiative 573 meets that standard. Uh, I think it is a classic example of a statute enacted not with the purpose of affecting the result of any particular election, but of resetting and reestablishing the rules of the game, which is exactly what I think the plaintiffs concede is an appropriate thing that states can do under the time, place, and manner clause. The state is here saying, we're not going to say who can be elected in any particular election. We're just saying the election has to be conducted according to the following terms. That's a classic outcome neutral statute. I don't support the line of analysis that Mr. Smith <coughs> suggests, but even if the court adopted it, I think this statute could pass muster. We have suggested in our answering brief a different analysis altogether and one which I think the court will find more useful. And that is to say that the qualifications clause speaks to the issue of who is entitled to a be elected, who is entitled to a certificate of election to begin service if they win the election. If you take someone, for instance, who does not meet the citizenship requirement, the issue is even if by some chance a person who did not meet that qualification uh, survived an election and got a plurality of the vote, 
that person would not be entitled to a seat in Congress because he or she would not meet one of the qualifications set in the Constitution itself. I think the same would be true of any clear qualification that a state might purport to set. Um, suppose the state passed a statute, for instance, saying no one may serve in Congress except someone who is a high school graduate. And they put some teeth in it by saying that no one who didn't meet this additional requirement uh, was qualified to file for election or for ballot access, or even that the votes for such people would not be counted. I think that would clearly be an additional qualification and would have to be judged as such. Would be unconstitutional, you think? I don't think it would necessarily be unconstitutional. It would depend upon the First and Fourteenth Amendment, uh, because I think we've said that states could, under appropriate circumstances, add qualifications. However, but under the qualifications clause, you think it could be provided that by a state that nobody but high school graduates has ballot access? I don't know, Your Honor. I think one would have to determine what, exactly who that affected and what the implications would be, whether the state could draw that particular classification. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, it would take me several months to research that. And uh, fortunately, the Washington State Legislature, nor the, the people by initiative, have passed such a statute. But it would be a qualification statute. I think there's, there's no question about that. There's considerable contrast between that kind of a statute, which says, here's a category of people which is not entitled to be elected, no matter what the result of the vote, They're not entitled to serve, and the present law, which says, here's a category of people that we are going to deny access to the printed ballot. However, Section 6 of the initiative specifically says, nothing in this statute is intended to restrict the right of the voters to write in the name of their preferred candidate. And if that preferred candidate wins the election, it doesn't restrict the right of that candidate to take office. So e even apart from the recitals, though, and just looking at the text of 573, isn't its necessary thrust and effect to make it very difficult for incumbents to win elections? I think it is undoubtedly intended to make it more difficult and perhaps much more difficult for incum incumbents to win election. As and can a state handicap one group of potential candidates while thus favoring another group? I think it can handicap this particular group for, for the very reason that this group is characterized by its very past electoral success. And this is, I, th I think it's fair to say, this is a case of first impression. This particular state interest has never been the subject of federal litigation uh, in any clear way. And I think that what the court will have to analyze is the stated purpose behind the statute, which is to level the playing field, to open the electoral process up to more candidates who meet the constitutional qualifications against whatever burden it may cause the voters. Now, I, I don't think there is any significant interest here of candidates. After all, we're saying people can run and they can be elected three times. We're also saying that they can continue to run for a fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh term so long as they do it by write-in. So uh, I think the burden on any individual candidate is not that great, particularly if you look at them over their lifetime. It also doesn't restrict them from staying out for a term or two and then coming back. It doesn't restrict them from moving and running for another office. It's not a lifetime ban, quite different from some of the other statutes that have been passed in other jurisdictions. I think it's important then to consider the fact that this initiative specifically preserves the right of any qualified candidate to seek election and if successful to receive a certificate of election and to continue to serve in Congress. Non-incumbency is not created as a qualification under this law at all. It doesn't fit within the qualification clause analysis. This brings me to my third subject, which is, is this a gimmick? Is it a guise? Now, I don't see any gimmicks or guises uh, of this type discussed in the Powell case. Uh, throughout this case, it appears to me that the plaintiffs must have a different version of the Powell case, which must be about three times as long and discuss many more subjects than the copy that I have. The Powell case is all about whether or not one House of Congress can exclude a member under its power uh, to, ex to judge the qualification of its own members. And I guess if there's a gimmick, and I don't think the Powell Court ever uses that word, uh, 
it's the, was the House of Representatives' attempt to use that clause to exclude an elected, uh, uh, a representative elect uh, who's for, for misconduct in a past Congress. Suppose, Congress. Suppose, let me ask you a hypothetical question, Mr. Ferris. Suppose a state were to have the opposite impulse from the one that led to 573. And the legislature of this state decides that uh, far from thinking long-term service leads to hackdom and entrenched self-interest, it really leads to wisdom. And further, it leads to power in relation to other states' delegations. So they pass with a lot of elaborate recitals about the virtues and wisdom of old age and long service. They pass a measure providing that no one can have access to the ballot for U.S. Senate without having served at least six years first in the U.S. House of Representatives. Constitutional? Well, I don't have to defend that one, Your Honor, uh, but I do have to defend the hypothetical. Uh, <clears throat> and I would be willing to take it on and say it's constitutional, yes for the reason that if, if they could establish, uh, I think that's a legitimate reason that, that the legislature could consider, and, and I think it could decide uh, that it had legitimate reason to do so. Then the issue would be, would it pass muster under the First Amendment uh, as made applicable to the states through the 14th, or perhaps some other uh, uh, provision of the Constitution which someone might uh, divine uh, might, might be relevant but my initial thought would be that it probably could. Uh, constitutional con under the qualifications clause. Content neutral, clause. yeah. Constitutional under, under the qualifications clause. Now suppose the same state legislature a few years later were to decide that there should be an experience requirement for, to get on the ballot for the U.S. House of Representatives. And they passed a law saying no one will have ballot access for this office in this state, United States House unless you first serve six years in the state legislature. And in this way, we're going to assure ourselves of competence, long proved trustworthiness, and so on. And we're going to have a government run not by rank amateurs, but run by highly seasoned public officials. Well, I Constitutional? So first of all, Mr. Thorstead would be thrilled given the argument he made today, but uh, <laughs> I think that one's more difficult, and it would be more difficult only because the state might have a more difficult time justifying service in the state legislature as appropriate. You know, they might have a difficult time either way because they would have the burden, undoubtedly, of showing that the state interest overcame the restriction uh, that they were undoubtedly placing upon the choice of the voters. I can't predict for sure how those, either of those cases would come out. I can well, say that the voters in this case didn't do that. If it's under the qualifications clause, you don't weigh anything else, do you? It's either a prohibited extra qualification. Or I don't agree with that, Your Honor. I think I don't agree with the plaintiff's view, which is it's absolutely prohibited. But on the other hand, I don't think any of us would contend that states can add any qualification they like, because the states in all state laws are fully subject to not violating other constitutional rights. Well, that's so, of course they are. But your view is that the qualifications clause itself Qualification simply clause doesn't itself, prevent the states from adding any requirement they want to add. That is my view. However, it's also my view that the court not read that, reach that issue, or need not reach that issue today. Mm -hmm. My third point is the write-in provisions of Washington state law, and I think I, I need to touch on it because the plaintiffs, both in their brief and in their discussion and argument today, have, I think, mischaracterized the difficulty of winning election by write-in, and to some extent, perhaps slight, have mischaracterized even the state of Washington law on this question. Uh, they seem to want to characterize the write-in possibility as so remote as to be meaningless and negligible. I want to make three points on that issue. First, I think it's clear from history that elections can be won by write-in in Washington, where it has happened, and elsewhere where it has happened. Congressional elections can be won by write-in. Well-financed incumbents with good name familiarity would probably have a much better chance, I think most people can, can reason, to run a successful write-in campaign than the typical write-in campaign which is now conducted, which is nearly always by someone who didn't have the foresight to bother to file. How many day. have been elected to Congress in this state in its history by the write-in method? I don't believe anyone has been elected to Congress by write-in in Washington. 
But you can't really test that because it isn't very often, in fact, I think it's unknown, that incumbents would say, you know, I think just for fun I won't file this year, I'll run a write-in. <laughs> they don't do that. And uh, they take, take their opportunity to file and, and appear on the ballot. So I, I think that the short answer is we really don't have a record on that. However, what we do know is that candidates for Congress, including uh, Senator Strom Thurmond, who is still serving, have successfully won election by writing. Well, that was in South Carolina. It was in South Carolina, <laughs> where people I trust. We know how to write here, also. Did you want to keep to, to 20 minutes? Yes, am I about done? Uh, actually, you've talked for 22, and it's partly my fault for questions, but if, if you well, can finish I up. I appreciate now, your questions. Let me just finish up, finish up then and point out that uh, I am aware, to, to catch one point, of nothing in state law which would restrict the ability of a party, or particularly the Democratic Party, to take any position it wanted with respect to who it wanted as a candidate for, for U.S. House or any other job. And I was confused by the plaintiff's argument that somehow this would be restricted by the law. My final argument is simply that I think the court should carefully consider uh, to the extent it feels there is any room constitutionally, the policy implications here. I think it would be important to consider the right of the people on a state-by-state -state basis, I'm going to exactly counter counsel's argument, uh, to experiment, frankly, to decide for themselves what type of candidates they want to elect to Congress and, and enact reasonable and otherwise constitutional limitations. This is by state statute. It can be repealed. It can be amended. Different states can enact different things. They're each, after all, each one deciding about their own delegations in Congress. I don't see any great constitutional harm in that, maybe for precisely the reason plaintiffs stated. It's not the same problem as Congress legislating for the whole body. Uh, it affects, in each case, even in the case of California, only about one-ninth of the whole Congress. So I think the policy justifications are all in favor of this statute. I think the court will find uh, on examination that it's a reasonable time, place, and manner restriction, and then it's consistent with the federal constitution. Thank you. Mr. Bell. Thank you, Your Honor. They say, uh, I've always heard that Justice Black carried a copy of the Constitution around his pocket, and when somebody would ask him a question about the Constitution, he'd look in the Constitution, which is sort of a logical approach, I right, think. That's what this is, right? Same one. <laughs> Probably the same edition. We are dealing with uh, three sections of uh, Article One, which creates the House of Representatives and the Senate. Uh, one of the important things is that there's a connection to the states. They say that the electors in each state will have the qualifications requisite for electors of the most numerous branch of the state legislature. So that's a, that's a connection with the, with the states. Then they say no person shall be a representative who shall not obtain the age of 25 years, been seven years a citizen of the United States, and who shall not, when elected, be an inhabitant of the state in which he shall be chosen. And there's similar qualifications for the Senate. At the time uh, the Constitution was adopted, there was a, we had had a, uh, Articles of Confederation, we had a Congress on the Articles, and they had term limits in that Constitution. Came up at the uh, Constitutional Convention, Virginia presented a plan with a, uh, for a bar and a, a rotation system and left a, the number of years blank, and that was just never dealt with. It dropped out of the uh, debate, uh, the considerations, and so we didn't carry forward from the Articles of Confederation to the Constitution of term limits. But we did, uh, in addition to the at state connection, we did, they did uh, adopt Article uh, Section 4. This is very important, Section 4, because it reserves to the states the, the power over the times, places, and manner of holding elections, the senators and representatives. And, but to say, and this is, what I think may, maybe make this, makes this into a political question. But Congress may at any time, by law, make or alter 
such regulations, that is the state regulations, except as to the place of choosing senators. So if Speaker Foley is dissatisfied with this, what the people of Washington have done, I'm sure he could, would have no trouble getting a bill introduced in the House to modify the term limits, whether he could abolish term limits of the Congress or under this language would pr present another serious constitutional question. But that is a, an alternative to, uh, to what's going on here today. The uh, issue to me really gets down on what are the limits on the power of the people in this state or any country, or any state for that matter. The Tenth Amendment, I always thought meant something until today. I heard the argument made that it didn't apply to the federal government because we didn't have a Congress. We just created one, so you, it meant nothing. But it's in broad language and says that uh, talk of power and says that the power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution. You understand this was not adopted until a year, or two years almost after the Constitution was ratified. Congress in, the, in, the, in 1791, in the first section, session of Congress under the new government, promulgated this amendment. So the government was already in existence. It says the power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution nor prohibited by it to the states, or reserved to the states, respectively, or to the people. Now, the question we have today is, uh, as near as we can determine, has never really been precisely presented uh, to the Supreme Court, but the, the uh, court has had two cases. Your Honor has already referred to both of them. I don't want to care cold or new counsel, but I would like to say that the Powell case dealt explicitly with the power of the Congress. And the power of the Congress, the court held, is set out in section two and section three, these three qualifications. Later on in another case, the Leho versus uh, Buckley, uh, the court recited that that case dealt only with the power of the Congress or to pursue the, to uh, judge the qualifications in Powell, Powell had been elected to the Congress, duly elected by the people of New York under their election laws. The, uh, there were some char ethical charges against him on some of the rules of the, of the House. There were two ways to deal with it. One way would be to say that he didn't meet the qualifi uh, qualifications, that he was not ethical, therefore he couldn't be seated. And that would uh, require a majority vote <coughs> to seat him. The other way would be if he was elected and was seated, he would be, could be expelled, but it'd take two-thirds vote. So the House was dealing with the uh, session, uh, section under which it would just take a majority vote. So I don't find anything in that case that has anything to do with the states other than the uh, previous report of the House and the McRiver uh, incident incident, we'll call it, Mr. Smith called it a case. It was not a case, it was not in court. They had a committee of the Congress, of the House, uh, deciding whether or not the state of Maryland could pass a statute saying if you were from the congressional district that em embraced uh, Baltimore, that you had to be a resident of Baltimore to run. And that was what the, what the McGreevo was about. And the, court, and the Congress, in that committee report, said that they couldn't add that qualification. That's the best authority, I think, they have. And that's in a House report, not a, not a lawsuit, uh, uh, not a court holding. Now, in point of fact, the, uh, there were a number of, uh, at least one qualification that, other than the ones in the Constitution, most of the states uh, required uh, you to be a property owner to vote and uh, to, to run for office to be a, a property owner. All that's gone by the board long ago, but that was what the situation was at the time of the founding of the republic. The, uh, 
states have generally assumed that they could have qualifications. For example, in, in uh, Minnesota, you have to be a resident of the district, congressional district in which you're running. In Idaho, you have to be a domiciled for two years. Uh, in uh, Arkansas, you can't run, cannot run for U.S. Senate if you've been appointed to the office. That's, a, that's in the Arkansas Constitution. There was a senator in, in Washington when I was there who was from Arkansas, was appointed by the governor, and he could not run for the office. There was also, a, uh, this not apropos, but there was a judge on the Supreme Court who couldn't run for re-election from Arkansas. That was a state office, but the Senate, Senate in the, uh, in the House are included in that Arkansas. There are other qualifications of various sorts in the states. Uh, Your Honor asked whether you could have a qualification that you had to be a registered voter to run for office. That would get into residence uh, as well as uh, just a good citizenship. Uh, Mr. Cutler said, I think he said that would be a minor qualification. But whatever it is, I think the states could do that. We don't have to rely on the uh, construction of the qualifications clause. I think the time, manner, and place uh, provision would cover what we're doing now because in Stora, Stora, which the court referred to, and it, oddly enough, uh, it was said of uh, our team that we didn't cite Powell in our brief. Oddly enough, this is what's odd, the uh, Supreme Court in Stora didn't cite Powell either. Uh, so it makes you, leads me to believe that Powell is a very narrow decision. Uh, that would have been a very easy way to, uh, to decide the uh, Stora case. Uh, the other way. Now the um, thing that I think we're dealing with, as I said earlier, we don't, we, there's no case precisely in point. I think that this is a, we're dealing with an election restriction. Now whether it's a, uh, unconstitutional or any ground, it remains to be seen. I think it, uh, that we, we need to uh, go slow in ruling this unconstitutional. And the court knows in the famous decision of Ash Wanda versus TVA, Justice Brandeis's concurring opinion, he uh, said that all judges ought to be slow to declare laws unconstitutional uh, and to decide the case on any, any other ground that could be found that was reasonable. That would be a that leads me into the political question. I don't think it, it's necessary to, to if, even if the court thought it was a grave constitutional question, it may not be necessary to decide it at all, but just to say there's a political question that ought to be left to the, the Congress. After all, who is involved in, in the law? Who, who is the target of the law? It's people, it's people in the Congress. And then, Oddly enough, not another odd thing, not one state is ever voted on term limits except where the state has an initiative. And Congress has never called up the uh, a vote on, in the committee, or committees, I think it may be before two, on a, whether we're going to be allowed to vote as a people on, a, on an amendment to the Constitution for term limits. So that is a good reason not to um, decide the case except on a political question. I think it, uh, there's no doubt that the court could uphold this, uh, and it would then get on en route to the Supreme Court. I'm sure the, the plaintiffs would appeal it to the Ninth Circuit and then go on to the Supreme Court. That's going to take quite a time. We've already, law's over, yeah, over now. Uh, or the court could uh, rule against us, and uh, in that event, we run into the question of, of uh, paying fees on the Civil Rights Act, which I thought was the most audacious thing I've seen. 
people in the estate are trying to find out what the law means. They, they adopted the initiative, and now they're going to be punished by doing so. They're going to have to pay. They are, I hope the court won't agree with them, but they're asking for legal fees. Uh, that may, means that people are going to be told that you better be careful in the future about these initiatives. You, you don't know when you may get the taxpayers may have to pay. I think that uh, I would uh, I would urge the court to follow what I think the Constitution says, either saying that they are there is a basis for <laughs> additional qualifications, or that this was a reasonable uh, restriction on the time, uh, place, and manner. The uh, it certainly is a uh, substantial state interest in the turning over. Uh, the people that serve in the Congress every few years, at least the people of the state thought so. Uh, it seemed to me rational that they could have had that thought, and uh, therefore uh, there's a basis for it. That would be uh, uh, one of the things that, uh, that struck me about this whole matter is how we've gotten ourselves, <laughs> we proved we, it almost falls of its own weight. You ought to ask about the, being a registered voter. And uh, New, a state court in New York apparently has held that you couldn't bar a felon from running. I've got a mental picture of the, of the uh, founding father sitting around uh, uh, agreeing that it would be fine to have a felon running for Congress for the House or the Senate. And that's where this case finally ends up. If you can't, if the state can't, uh, if you can't bar a felon, and you, incidentally, you'd bar one in most states if they can't register to vote because a felon loses his rights to vote. But that's sort of where this ends up. It proves too much. It's like arguing that, that, uh, that Powell versus McCormick held something against the states when it did not. It's certainly no, it's unbelievable that the founding fathers would have, would have thought that the states had lost all their, their rights over elections. And, uh, and I'm sure that they, <coughs> that they didn't. In fact, we know that they didn't. So uh, I would uh, say that this power was reserved to the people and to the states under the Tenth Amendment. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that that happened. Uh, whether this uh, law is uh, faulty because they got ended up with two sets of write-in rules, one set for these uh, candidates, for these uh, congressmen, and one set for other write-ins. One, can, as I understand it, Washington law, one can get on the ballot and one can't. That's a different question. If the court were to say that the, uh, I find that faulty, and it, to the point of being unconstitutional, then the state can fix that pretty easily by giving them the same rights as the other write-ins. And uh, that's a, more of a side issue. It would be like almost conceding that that the law is constitutional, but or can be made constitutional. And uh, that may be a, another uh, way that the court would want to approach the matter. Uh, thank you, Arm. If I may uh, ask you a question or two, Mr. Bell. Good. The Constitution says in Article 2, I mean Section 2 of Article 1, no person shall be a representative who shall not have attained the age of 25 years. And in section three, no person shall be a senator who shall not have attained the age of 30 years. Now suppose we're dealing with a state legislature that is on the whole advanced in years and places a great premium on the wisdom that comes with age. So they pass a statute saying, instead of 25 and 30 years for the two houses of the national legislature, in this state you have to be at least 45 for the House, or at least 50 for the Senate. Would that be constitutional? I, I, have, I would have some trouble uh, believing that was constitutional. That goes straight against the, the uh, what's said in the Constitution. That's uh, almost changing, changing these. Uh, but you could argue, on the other hand, that it is, because uh, 
you have to be an inhabitant of the state, and that's been changed many times. More, that's been expanded. It's not exactly the same, though, as saying the uh, age is going to be changed. Well, this, this legislature, let's assume, has made note in its preamble that the, con the Constitution says, who shall not have attained the age of 25 years. And the person who's 45, of course, has attained that age. Could that constitutionally be done? I don't know. I don't know. Those are, those are hard questions. All, all the hypotheticals on the Constitution are difficult to answer. Well, let me ask you one more, if I may. And I asked this earlier, Mr. Ferris. Suppose the citizens of a state or the legislature were overwhelmed with the thought that seniority, experience, knowledge of the ropes, all that counts and is foremost to us. So therefore, we pass this statute, which will bring to our delegation assured wisdom, uh, knowledge, experience, and will also give us power in relation to other states who haven't done this. And we're going to provide that you have access to the ballot for U.S. Senate only if you've served first six years in the House of Representatives. Well, that would be the uh, uh, balancing test. Whether it's rational, whether it serves a compelling state interest, and what effect it has on other people who might want to run, or voters who might want to select someone else to run, that would be a. I doubt that that would pass muster, but it would. Uh, you could get have an argument about it. Now, if it was a. Uh, well, if having an experience qualification doesn't pass muster, how do you think an inexperienced qualification? Past well, that not, was not the basis for the law. I, I, know, I, I think they were trying to break a deadlock or a gridlock that the Congress has on the people. It's generally believed that they, have, they stay too long and have too much power. And that, that gets back to the question I said, what limit is there on the power of the people? Thank you. Thank you. Now, next, uh, I believe, is Ms. LeFevre. May it please the court, I'm Deborah Lefaitre from Pacific Legal Foundation, representing citizens for term limits. Thus far this morning, the discussion has mostly revolved around the qualifications clause. The plaintiffs have strenuously argued that that's how this measure should be characterized, and it's not so difficult to understand why. Because when this measure is analyzed under the ballot access cases, addressing the First and Fourteenth Amendment concerns, Initiative 573 is clearly con constitutional. The states are expressly authorized under Article I, Section 4 of the United States Constitution to regulate the time, place, and manner of, of elections, including federal elections. Congress maintains the power to alter those regulations and has, uh, as James Madison referred to it, the ultimate control. Uh, that would be the remedy that the plaintiffs could seek here. The ballot access regulations must be addressed under the First and Fourteenth Amendments. Now, in their briefs, the plaintiffs actually listed four rights that they asserted uh, to be violated or infringed by this measure. And those four were the rights to vote, the rights to be a candidate, the rights to freely associate, and the right to maintain equal stature with other members of Congress. Today, they've narrowed that down to only two rights, and it's understandable why. As for the right to be a candidate, the US Supreme Court has expressly stated that there is no fundamental right to candidacy, and that's, that just pretty much uh, sums that one up. For the right to maintain equal stature within Congress, I think that's a uh, can of worms that the plaintiffs don't really want to entertain. What with the differences between those who run committees and those who don't, and majority parties and minority parties. And so we are left really with the two primary rights that are touched upon, if not severely infringed, by Initiative 573. And those are the right to vote, which is championed primarily by the ACLU, and the freedom of association, 
which is uh, the hook on which the plaintiffs have mainly hung their hat. Now, on the freedom of association, there are really two associations at stake here. The first is between the voter and the candidate, and the second is between the candidate and its political party. And today, the plaintiffs ha have mostly concentrated on the second association, that between the candidate and the political party. Now, as a preliminary matter, it's interesting to wonder who is asserting these political party rights. The, uh, the plaintiffs have not expressly stated that they are attempting to assert third party standing on behalf of the Democratic Party, who is presumably more than capable of defending its own interests. Uh, they cite primarily as their, their primary cases, the U and Tastian cases, but don't really tell you the full title of those cases, which are namely U versus the, Demo the San Francisco Democratic Central Committee and Tastian versus the Republican Party of Connecticut. In those cases, the parties were right in the litigation to protect their own interests. Now, the ACLU characterized the association interests of these, the number of, of interests that might be implicated as the most severe, and yet it's interesting that if these are the most severe interests, bur interests burdened, that none of the political parties have stepped forward to intervene in this case, nor has anyone suggested that they need to be joined under Rule 19 of the Federal Rules of Court. Beyond that procedural issue, there is a, a major problem on the substance of their claims, which is namely that there is no harm to the political parties, which probably understands why they're not involved in the case. In the U case, what was at stake was a California prohibition against uh, the party's endorsements of a particular individual in their primaries. Also, the statutes heavily regulated the internal structure of the political parties, even down to how many members of the board could be from Northern California and how many had to be from Southern California. It was this extremely harsh internal regulation of the parties that was found to violate the freedom of association. Similarly, in the Tastian case, the court held that political parties may open primaries to independence despite state law uh, to the contrary. And this is because in Connecticut, there the two major parties had substantial registration, and yet there were a substantial number of independents. The, the court did not require open primaries, that is, it did not requ require, say that the, uh, I'm sorry, the court decision did not require open primaries, requiring Republicans to accept Democrats uh, to vote in their primaries. However, this large pool of independents uh, was out there and open to be swayed, and the court held that the, free, that the freedom of association could not uh, prohibit the Republican Party from attempting to sway those voters onto their side. In this case, incumbents may still participate within their party. They can still fundraise for their party and be spokespersons for their party. They can be the standard bearer for their party for any other office other than that which they have served the, uh, the number of terms mentioned in the statute. And after the short waiting period of six years, they can again be their party standard bearer with their name printed on the ballot for the office that they had served in previously. The other rights that were mentioned were the right to vote, and this was stressed by, by the ACLU and touched upon by, by some of my co-counsel in this case. There is no right to vote for a particular candidate. The, su the Supreme Court decision in Burdick v. Takushi made that perfectly plain when it struck down Hawaii's ban on writing voting. It's also instructive to look at Burdick because Burdick looked at the totality of circumstances around elections. It wasn't that it was necessarily denigrating the write-in vote as, as a meaningful exercise of the franchise, but in, Ho in Hawaii it took all of 15 signatures to get your name on the primary ballot. The number of people in this courtroom could run an entire slate in Hawaii. That being the case, the write-in was not considered to be as important as it might, it might be in other states. But the, so therefore, what to draw from Burdick is that there is no right to vote for a particular person. And this segues with the uh, other court decision saying that there's no fundamental right to be a candidate. Here, what we're really talking about is 
third tier rights uh, for the for the plaintiffs because they are voters who want to vote for a particular candidate who has no fundamental right to be a candidate. Therefore, to describe this as a severe infringement of fundamental rights is simply to blow the measure out of proportion. Would it ever be appropriate then to test the legality, the constitutionality of this measure in court? Oh, yes, Your Honor, it is certainly appropriate to test the constitutionality uh, because the arguments uh, can be made and certainly the plaintiffs feel that their rights have been severely infringed and they have a right to bring a lawsuit. However, the Supreme Court decisions make the decision on the ballot access issue uh, easier than the, the plaintiffs would suggest. Now, well, the as plaintiffs... I, if I understood what you've been telling me, you, you say that there is no right to be a candidate. No fundamental right to be a candidate, correct. And there is no right to vote for a particular person? That is also correct, Your Honor. So how would this initiative ever come up for constitutional review? Well, it, this initiative primarily came up for constitutional review on the qualifications clause, but they did make these First and Fourteenth Amendment arguments as their backup, and they need to be addressed in that way. Uh, in other uh, cases that have dealt either with ballot access restrictions or term limits, actual term limits, on the state level, these for First and Fourteenth Amendment issues have also been addressed. For example, in Legislature versus You, the California Supreme Court case, which plaintiffs have studiously ignored, the uh, court addressed every single one of these First and Fourteenth Amendment issues, and in that case, it was in the context not only of a lifetime ban on office after a certain number of terms, but the uh, initiative in that case also slashed the legislative budget and did away with the legislative pensions. And looking at all of that put together, the California Supreme Court said that was the least restrictive alternative, even though it didn't need to address it under strict scrutiny and instead addressed it under the, the Anderson balancing test, it went the further step and, uh, and announced that as well. Uh, in addition, uh, I, I'm getting ahead of myself slightly here because we, we need to talk about the Anderson balancing test. Although in their briefs the plaintiffs had originally uh, argued that this case deserved to be uh, reviewed under strict scrutiny. Uh, counsel today has stated that the Anderson test is appropriate and stated the, the portions of the Anderson test that we need to look at, namely the asserted injuries to the plaintiffs, which we've talked about, and the interests of the state. Now, the plaintiffs do an interesting shuffle on the interests of the state, claiming that the looking at the older uh, or more traditional ballot access cases, which uh, in effect, if not in intent, tend to keep us new, smaller minority parties off the ballot, and have looked at those interests and say, well, this measure doesn't address those interests. Well, Your Honor, this measure isn't supposed to address those interests. The interests that this measure is supposed to address have been stated in the findings of the measure. Uh, the, this measure is supposed to encourage a reasonable degree of rotation. It's supposed to deal with the entrenched incumbency, which has become indifferent to the people. It's supposed to counteract the uh, campaign financing and gerrymandering that the Congress has rigged in favor of itself. It's supposed to eliminate the preoccupation with re-election. Uh, and it goes on and on. And those are the interests that Initiative 573 is intended to further. And in fact, it does further those interests. Both the high courts of California and of New York have addressed these issues in the context of term limits and in ballot access regulations and have found these interests to be very compelling. In fact, in the New York case, uh, Golden v. Clark, the court held that there is just a de minimis burden on individuals' rights of expression and association that's justified by the important governmental interests in eliminating conflicts of interest, broadening opportunities for political and public participation, reducing opportunities for corruption, and increasing public confidence in governmental integrity and effectiveness. Now, these are the interests that are intended to and are furthered by Initiative 573. And so when you compare these compelling state interests against the minor infringement of the rights of the plaintiffs. And I would emphasize at this point that the plaintiffs are not denied the right to vote for any candidate. You know, that, that was the case in California, but that's not in which the, 
the measure was upheld. But here, this is what they wanted in California. This is the least restrictive alternative that the plaintiffs in that case were arguing for. This is a consecutive, uh, this is ballot access restrictions based on consecutive tenure. They have a waiting period and the, uh, the Supreme Court has stated that waiting periods are constitutional. Uh, there have been cases dealing with two years to 40 months and uh, even a seven year uh, durational residency requirement that has been upheld. So the six years here just does not rise to the level of a, a constitutional injury. Finally, the, the plaintiffs have complained about uh, violations under Reynolds v. Sims, which was, of course, the reapportionment case that requires one man, one vote. Here, that is not a problem because all votes are counted. That's been made plain by the uh, declaration, declaration submitted by the state and which has been stated by co-counsel today. And the candidate with the most votes win. Because of that very simple truth, Initiative 573 is not a qualification to the Constitution and must be handled on, or must be analyzed under the First and Fourteenth Amendments. And like the other cases that have addressed First and Fourteenth Amendment issues, this court should find, as those have found, that the state interests outweigh the, advent the interests of the incumbents in assuring their perpetual reelection. Thank you. Now, before you sit down, yes. a couple of questions. Suppose a state were to provide that if you want to run for re-election to Congress and to have ballot access for that purpose, and if you're already in Congress, you need to show that you were present for at least half of the roll call votes during the last session or during your term in office. And if you can't show that, you don't get ballot access. Constitutional? Your Honor, I, I believe that assuming the interests in tying that particular uh, requirement uh, could, be, could be certainly upheld under the Qualifications Clause, under First and Fourteenth Amendment, I'd, I don't see any problem with that, again, because there's no suspect class. Everyone is treated equally. Uh, there's no real infringement. The requirement would be, I suppose, the, the compelling state interest would be in electing representatives who do their job. And I, I believe that the, the courts would find that to be a compelling interest. And uh, with, with minimal burden, I, yes, that would be constitutional, Your Honor. Now suppose that same feeling, we want to just have people who are going to do the job, led a state to adopt a measure that would be the reverse of the one we have here. Now, let's say it would provide that to run for Congress, you must first serve six years in the uh, Washington State <coughs> Legislature, unless you're already a member of Congress. Would that be constitutional? The primary problem that that measure would encounter would be the overall policy goals announced by the Supreme Court in the fluidity of political life, in not permitting a, a freezing of the status quo, which that sort of measure might run into trouble, and that would have to be a decision made at that time. But again, it doesn't affect anyone in terms of a suspect class, and uh, your, your hypothetical your honor, does not address the possibility of a write-in, which is uh, far more than the gimmick that the, the plaintiffs uh, deride it as. You mean if, uh, so if all others could be written in but not be on the ballot, but members of the state legislature could be on the ballot, that would hold up, do you think? That only members of the state legislature could be on the ballot. I think I, the, the problems with, with the Janice v. Fortson case and Clemens v. Fashing in terms of giving tremendous advantages to the single most advantaged class. That's, that has run into problems before because the, the Supreme Court has stated it does not want uh, 
to give a monopoly to the two parties. It wants new candidates to have the opportunity to run for office. And that would be the only problem that I, I would see in terms of the constitutionality of that under, under these amendments. You mean the state can handicap some groups of candidates but not others? Your Honor, I don't view it as a handicapping measure as such because the incumbents who are affected by Initiative 573 have so many other avenues of getting out not only their name and their the vote, you know, in favor of themselves, that it you have to look at who, who is being affected and how. And when a, an initiative or a legislative act seeks to disadvantage already disadvantaged groups, then courts tend to look on that much more harshly than in reverse. All right, thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Now uh, next, uh, Mr. Kester. Your Honor, the court has been extraordinarily generous with your time this morning. Uh, I have about half a dozen points to make. I thought I would try to pick up a few loose ends since I'm the last speaker for our side uh, and perhaps summarize a bit. But I do hope that if there is anything that the court wants to talk about that hasn't been covered, uh, you will ask me about it. First point, when, the, when these cases began, uh, in the initial briefs, uh, the plaintiffs made a big point of the fact that the framers had not written and mandated term limits in the federal constitution nationally. A few objectors wished that they had. Uh, I take it that that argument, such as it was, has been basically abandoned. We all know that term limits are not required by the federal constitution. What's important is the federal constitution did not prohibit states from passing term limits, or indeed states from passing any other election laws that they might want to pass. Uh, in fact, uh, they quite consciously and explicitly in Article 1, Section 4, left the running of federal elections to the states. Uh, it was said in an argument for the plaintiffs, I think at one point, that uh, somehow this is a federal question and uh, a federal matter, and the states can't touch it. What the framers intended was exactly the opposite. And the Supreme Court has remarked on that in many, many cases, Your Honor. In the in store against Brown, the court said that states have enacted comprehensive election codes that include qualifications. Uh, in the classic case, the Supreme Court said, and I quote, the states are authorized to legislate on elections to the extent that Congress has not acted. And that, that, Your Honor, when we get into all of this uh, parade of horribles, uh, is something to keep in mind. We start out with a framework in which the states can legislate. What checks are there to keep the states from going haywire and passing all sorts of crazy laws on this <coughs> subject? There are two, at least two, very important checks. The first check is a judicial one, and that's the 14th Amendment. All of these uh, various horribles that were paraded here this morning would be unconstitutional under the 14th Amendment. You mean including the, the one that requires experience? The one that requires experience that uh, Your Honor has asked everybody else about, and I guess I'll answer it, I'll answer it too. I've had more time to think about it, however. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, I think that there are a couple of difficulties with that one that would knock it out under the 14th Amendment uh, because First of all, unlike the term, uh, the term uh, limit ballot access provision that you have in the state of Washington here, uh, Your Honor's hypothetical would exclude nearly everyone. In order for Initiative 573 to affect anyone, they get to serve three full terms in the House of Representatives or, or two terms in the Senate. Uh, Your Honor's hypothetical would, uh, would basically exclude almost everybody in the state uh, from running. And I don't think that that would fit the 14th Amendment as the Supreme Court uh, interpreted it in 
uh, cases like Storr against Brown, as, as Ms. Lefetra said a while ago. The Supreme Court said, what we're concerned about is opening up the political process and not constricting it. The other check, Your Honor. So sticking with that uh, illustration for just a moment, as you see it, would that be constitutional under the qualifications clause? It, it, if it's just ballot access, it's not a qualification. Sure, the quali you, don't, you don't have to get to the qualifications clause on that. So and, just, and, just to be sure I understand now, the yeah. state legislature, as you see it, could provide that no one has ballot access for the Senate without serving first in the House, and no, no one may have ballot access to the House without first serving in the uh, state legislature. Yeah, and I don't think it would last 10 minutes under the 14th Amendment. But under the qualifications clause, you sure. see no problem. Sure, uh, I, I mean, basically, Your Honor, I, I, think, I think what we have in these cases today is that the plaintiffs come in here with a perfectly good 14th Amendment case. They're arguing there's a denial of rights. They're saying that, that this somehow is an unreasonable restriction. And they're making all the kinds of rights-type arguments that people make under the 14th Amendment. But when they do that, they immediately find themselves embarrassed. Because when you look at the Supreme Court decisions that apply the 14th Amendment to elections, you find, first of all, in Anderson against Celebrezzi and cases that follow it, which the plaintiffs have conceded is the test, all that the state needs to show is a rational basis for the legislation, except in these few peculiar protected group situations, the state need only show a rational basis. Then, Your Honor, you've got scads of cases, an important one being the, the California Supreme Court case in the legislature against you, which again, the plaintiffs have chosen not to address, uh, which say that these kinds of restrictions are perfectly fine and rational under the 14th Amendment. And, and half the states in the United States, Your Honor, have term limitations on state officials. The 14th Amendment argument is not a federal versus state argument. It would knock out the laws in more than half the states of the United States. And that's why the plaintiffs don't like to say that they really have to structure this as a 14th Amendment argument. So then here, they, here we're only dealing with the federal offices, aren't we? Here, here, we're, here we're dealing only with the federal offices. And yet their only real argument is under the 14th, but under the 14th they lose. So they try to come up with something else. And they go to the far less obvious argument, an argument that is contrary to the text and contrary to what everybody, everybody said at the time the Constitution was adopted, and contrary to Article I, Section 4, and contrary to the Supreme Court cases, and contrary to the very practice of the states as soon as the Constitution was adopted. And they say, that if there is a law that establishes a qualification, then that state law is invalid. And that, as Your Honor, I think, put your finger on during the earlier discussion this morning, that's an absolute kind of argument. Because, Your Honor, this is, they're not making a rights argument there, they're making a structural argument. They're saying the structure of the Constitution is such that states may not legislate in this area. But as soon as... Do you, do you agree that Congress cannot do that? I think, Your Honor, if we don't have that in front of us, I think, I think that based on, based on the history of the Constitution and based on some of the language in Paul McCormick, you could say that Congress can't. But then you have Buckley against Vallejo, which came seven years after Paul against McCormick. Uh, my good friend Lloyd Cutler mentioned that he was counsel in, in Powell against McCormick, uh, which went the wrong way. Uh, and then, uh, but he was so modest that he neglected to tell us that he was counsel in Buckley against Vallejo. Well, we just don't have that much time, that's the thing. I, I, guess, <laughs> I guess that's so. And, and I, I, think you have, I think you have to say after Buckley and Vallejo, in the language which we quote in our briefs, uh, that Congress, uh, could legislate on this under its Article I, Section 4 power, because that's what the Supreme Court said. In Buckley against Vallejo, the Supreme Court explained what Powell covered and what it didn't cover. And it said, in Powell, we said that on, under Article I, Section 5, which is the House's 
a single house sitting in a quasi-judicial capacity, we said that a single house can't change the rules by itself when it's sitting in a quasi-judicial capacity. It said if Congress is going to act in this area, its authority would have to come under Article I, Section 4. And I think, I think that we have to take that as decided by the Supreme Court. I think you could find certainly some evidence in the congressional debates that would say that Congress perhaps couldn't, but I think that that, that bridge has been crossed. And that, Your Honor, is the other great check on crazy state laws on elections because Congress can act under Article I, Section 4 to override state laws any time. And so all of, all, of these, uh, all of these ghastly things that are, that are paraded out here, which would never survive the 14th Amendment if they somehow did, could always be uh, reversed by the, by the Congress. Do you read Powell as saying that Congress cannot add qualifications to election to the House of Representatives? Not at all. No. How do you read it in that respect? I, 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 think, I, think, Powell, I think Powell is very clear. The court in Powell says over and over again uh, that they are dealing with Article I, Section 5. What Powell says is that the House of Representatives, or if, if it were the Senate, the Senate judging its members, when it's sitting there as a judge, that's, that's the word that's used in the Constitution. This is one of the odd instances where a legislative body is acting in a quasi-judicial capacity. And it says, when they're acting as a judge, they can't say to Adam Clayton Powell, well, we got some new rules that are going to apply to your case. That's not the way judges are supposed to behave. They're limited when they're acting as a judge. And indeed, to legislate new qualifications, it would take a constitutionally enacted law. And a constitutionally enacted law, as the Supreme Court said in the Chadha case and other cases after it, requires passage by the Senate, passage by the House of Representatives, signature by the President of the United States, or overriding of a veto. So that, that's, a, that's a more difficult process than simply a, a single house saying, we're going to change the rules now that, you're now that we're judging you. Could Congress change the age limits, for example? Could they change the age limits? Right. I, I, think that's, I think that's one of the tougher questions. I, I, don't, I don't think they could lower the age limits, certainly, because that, that would be contrary to the Constitution. <coughs> could, they, could they raise them? Could they raise them? I think, th I think then, Your Honor, you, the, the case would be before you, is this so inconsistent with the intention of the framers? Did the framers, uh, did the framers mean to say that 25 years is enough, or did they simply, uh, or did they simply uh, mean to uh, leave that open as long as it was 25 years? I, I don't know what the answer is to that. I think, I think there are respectable arguments on either side. But we're not dealing here with any state provision or any act of Congress that is contrary uh, in any, you know, by any argument at all uh, to those qualifications set in, in the Constitution, which, by the way, as, as we pointed out, are not the only ones in the Constitution. Uh, Your Honor earlier referred to the negative wording of those provisions in Article I, Section 2. I, I, would, I would have to concede that the Supreme Court in Powell, and perhaps the only part of Powell that really uh, said anything to these issues, uh, said it didn't give much weight uh, to the wording of those as they finally came out. But there is something in the history of the Constitution, Your Honor, that's much more important than that, I would submit, which we, we quoted at length at page 16 of our reply brief. Uh, in drafting those provisions, the original version in the Committee on Detail said these are the qualifications, quote, and any person possessing these qualifications may be elected, close quote. Now, if those words were in the Constitution, we'd have a different Constitution, and it would mean something much closer to what these gentlemen said. But those were stricken, Your Honor. Those were stricken before we ever got farther down the line uh, to these uh, issues of negative wording or not. It's also important, I think, Your Honor, to look and see what the framers themselves thought they had done. And a good way to test that 
is to see what the states did as soon as they ratified the Constitution. In 1788 and in 1789, when the ratifications came in from the state legislatures, those same sessions of the state legislatures passed election laws for elections to the House of Representatives. And those very same state legislatures in their first election laws elected, enacted all sorts of additional qualifications. They put in extra residency requirements. They put in requirements for time of residency. <coughs> they put in requirements for residency in the district. They put in special nominating processes. And the great state of Virginia put in property requirements. You couldn't run unless you were a freeholder. And indeed, many of these, I don't believe the property requirements, which probably wouldn't survive under the 14th Amendment enacted a century later, but many such requirements, as Judge Bell and others pointed out, are still in the law today in many states. So here we have basically the same gang of people who ratified the Constitution turning around and as their next piece of business enacting laws which the plaintiffs here would say uh, they couldn't have done. Now, it was said that somehow, because this is a ballot access law and not a term restriction, it's a gimmick or a ruse or a guise or any number of, of uh, opprobrious words. The plaintiffs are asking this court to judge a law that's different from the law that the voters of Washington enacted. They say, let's pretend. Let's pretend it's a term limits law, and then we'll argue about that. Well, the difference between a ballot access law and a term limits law, Your Honor, uh, ma apparently mattered a great deal to the voters of the state of Washington, because there was a ballot in 1991 in which the voters defeated an initiative that called for term limits, restrictions on holding office. And so the drafters of the initiative went back and they came up with a different initiative, one that simply put limitations on ballot access for longtime incumbents. And in 1992, that was put to the voters of the state of Washington, and the voters of the state of Washington said, we wouldn't buy that first one, but we will buy this one. It made all the difference in the world, Your Honor. And it was certainly recognized that that is a different kind of a law. In the case of Joyner against Mofford, which I know the court is very familiar with, which is Ninth Circuit authority, the court emphasized the difference between ballot access restrictions and qualifications. And even more importantly, if you look in the Supreme Court decision, which Your Honor has quite properly referred to on several occasions, Storer against Brown. There was a qualifications clause argument made in Storer against Brown. It's almost easy to miss it because the, the Supreme Court gave it such a brush off that it didn't even mention it until the final footnote in the opinion. And the Supreme Court there said, I'm quoting in part, Appellants also contend that Section 6830 purports to establish an additional qualification for office of representative and is invalid under Article I, Section 2 of the Constitution. The argument is wholly without merit. The non-affiliation requirement no more establishes an additional requirement for the office of representative than the requirement that the candidate win the primary to secure a place on the general ballot or otherwise demonstrate substantial community report, support, close quote. And that, Your Honor, is what case after case after case in the Supreme Court has said time and again. All right, the time is now uh, up, plus a little extra. Okay. The court's been very patient, and I well, very much thank the court. You're very welcome. Now, I think that uses up the quota on this side of the room. So you saved some time for rebuttal. You actually saved 11 minutes. Uh, but to equal it out, I would be willing to go up to 15, which I think would probably be a little more than you need, judging by what I perceive at the council table. 
I'll try not to, not to abuse your patience. No, then take the full time if you'd like. Thank you. I have a few issues that I'd like to respond to that were raised uh, by the supporters of the measure. First, the concept of the negative phrasing was raised a couple of times. Uh, I believe that the Powell Court addressed this issue. It didn't give much significance to the negative phrasing, but I'd also point out uh, a historical quirk as well. The same negative phrasing was employed in Article 2, Section 1, defining the qualifications for the presidency. And we know that no states have passed statutes limiting terms for presidency. That, in fact, was addressed by the 22nd Amendment. Your Honor asked a question whether or not we would need any kind of factual determination on legislative intent. I think that the answer is no, but uh, I'm, I'm quite certain that it's no. But it's, it's no because there is no subjective intent issue with the purpose of this particular statute. Legislative interpretation is a matter of law. And as Your Honor knows, courts do this all of the time. The intent of the statute is set forth very clearly in the preamble to the statute as well as the voters pamphlet itself. It's not necessary to go into any subjective intent. In fact, in the state of Washington, as a rule of evidence, parties are precluded from submitting affidavits from legislators or the like on the issue of legislative intent because the courts don't want to hear what is the subjective intent of a legislature. They look to the official legislative history, and in the case of an initiative, the courts have said the legislative history is contained in the voters' pamphlet as well as the measure itself. Judge Bell also argued that we had a political question here that should be resolved by Congress. Again, this was a, an issue that was addressed specifically by the court in Powell at page 548. It's, hard to imagine that if Powell decided that a dispute between a member of Congress and the remaining body of Congress was not a political question, that we'd have a political question here. Your Honor asked a couple of questions about uh, a requirement of voter registration. And I answered the question initially by a discussion of the principles in Joyner versus Mofford. What I neglected to add was that the courts from Janus versus Fortson, uh, uh, continuing on to Storr versus Brown, talked about the difficulty that courts such as your own have in making the balancing that is required uh, under the Joyner versus Mofford doctrine. In the case of a voter registration measure, Joyner says that we weigh the burden on the candidate as well as evaluate the interests and the intent of the state. It could be in that particular requirement that there may be a state interest in requiring registration of candidates or voter registration of candidates to fulfill a valid state interest. For example, in RCW 29.15.090, there is a requirement that restricts how candidates may use their names on a ballot. The intent is to prevent something to mislead or deceive the voters or to have a candidate use a name that indicates a particular position on a particular issue. What the courts or what the uh, statute says there is that you must use your name in such a fashion that you don't mislead or confuse voters and it also must be the same last name in which you have registered as a voter. So in that context, it could be that the state has a legitimate interest in imposing such a requirement. However, if that requirement operates in such a way that it excludes candidates, then it would be an impermissible qualification. And let me give you an example. If, for example, the state in which this measure were imposed also forbade convicted felons from registering to vote, and a convicted felon had standing to challenge that measure by wanting to run for Congress but being denied that opportunity because that convicted felon was not a registered voter, then it seems to me as to that particular class of candidates, 
it may be an exclusion and an impermissible classification. Mr. Ferris indicated that it's okay to use this measure as a handicap to level the playing field. Your Honor, that's not the purpose of the qualifications clause. An electoral contest is not like a golf game. The purpose of handicapping in sports is usually to create an exciting contest or to, to promote a tie. I think that the lesson in Powell versus McCormick is, and, and I'm quoting from the language that uh, Hamilton used, or that was quoted by the Powell court uh, from Hamilton, is that the purpose of the qualifications clause and why it was limited to just three qualifications is to allow the voters to vote for whom they choose. I don't think there's any proper role in handicapping when we're talking about an electoral race uh, in the context of the qualifications clause. Mr. Ferris also indicated that there is nothing in the Powell case that talks about the uses of guises or gimmicks. Uh, it's at page 547, and what the court said is that you can't use uh, judging qualifications as a guise to impose an additional qualification. Mr. Ferris also said that the write in's okay because a candidate can win. I suppose theoretically that's possible, but the lesson of the recent cases of the Supreme Court, including Anderson versus Celebrezzi and Burdick versus Takuchi, <clears throat> is that a write in is not a substitute for a place on the ballot. In fact, Burdick says that if the election is otherwise fair, you can dispense with the requirement of a write-in altogether. <clears throat> Judge Bell discussed the McCreary case. Uh, he says it's not a case. I suppose technically he's correct. It's not a lawsuit. It was a case that was considered by the House. It was a challenge to a Maryland representative who was subject to a more stringent residency requirement. I don't think it's important whether or not it's a case. I think what's important is that the Powell Court thought enough of that incident to cite it, to discuss it, and to point out that it involved a much narrower issue than the, the exclusivity of the qualifications clause at large. Ms. Lefetra says that you does not apply here. He says, she says that uh, Congressman Foley can still become the Democratic Party standard bearer even if he can't run for his own office. What the U Court says is that it's an impermissible restriction if a party can't endorse a particular candidate for office because it withholds a flow of information to the voters at large. It seems an incredible stretch to argue that if a party can't endorse a candidate for office and that that's an impermissible infringement on the right of association, that that wouldn't apply to the much greater burden of not even allowing a candidate to run on the ballot. Last, Your Honor, there was some discussion by Mr. Kester concerning statutes that were enacted immediately after the convention that uh, imposed additional qualifications. My response to that is the same as the Powell Court's response. The Powell Court looked at the history after the passage of the Constitution. The Powell Court chose to focus in on the McCreary case. And the Powell Court says that qualifications are exclusive in the qualifications clause. Just because a state may have enacted an unconstitutional statute in the late 18th century doesn't mean that, it, that this statute is constitutional today. That's all that I wanted to address, Your Honor, unless you had any specific questions. No, I think it's all been covered. Thank, Thank you. you. But I think Mr. Cutler has something for you. Anything further? No, nothing further. Well, this has been a most uh, enjoyable morning for me. And uh, 
I want to congratulate all counsel on the job that was done in this case. I know it's quite a few of you have worked for free, I believe, anyway, in this matter. And what's been done in the briefs and in the arguments here today has been in the highest tradition of the bar. So my thanks to all concerned. We'll now be in recess. And I'll be getting out a written decision, too. Please rise. The Federal District Court in Seattle is considering arguments in a suit against Washington State's recently passed Congressional Term Limits Law. The law would limit the state's U.S. House members to six years in Congress and Senate members to 12 years. This week on America and the Courts, it's a look at Supreme Court oral arguments on the constitutionality of regulations requiring cable TV operators to set aside up to a third of their channels for local broadcasters. This week, the High Court heard oral